at the end of time. Thirteen. O'clock. Hey everybody, what's going on? It's Wednesday. It is Wednesday. It's the main show. Main show day, and this is going to be a good show today. And shit, man, I already drank half my drink. Look at that. So, yeah, no, you're getting drunk, man. No, I'm not. I'm about halfway <laughs> through mine, because well, we were see? sitting here 20 minutes for waiting, waiting for the show to warm up. I'm sending fucking messages out to friends saying the show's starting. <laughs> Send them out to regulars. Come on in. Yeah. Yeah, Murder Hornet's here. Katrina's here. Everybody's here. Sebastian's here. Jeff Yart. James, James Knapp showed back up. Iris is here. Alice in yep. Wonderland is here. Yep. Iris, Alice in Wonderland. Yep. So everybody's showing here. up. And uh, today's going to be a good show. This is about a famous con man. I've been wanting to do a show about this guy for a long time. Yeah. And honestly, I first heard about this guy, which I kind of feel like a lot of people that are around now, because he, he wrote an autobiography that came out back in 1980. Um, and he would kind of did the media circuit and shit like that, like back in the late seventies and eighties. So he was kind of like nationally famous back then, but I kind of feel like most people nowadays remember him because of the Steven Spielberg movie, catch me if you can, which came out in 2002, which was allegedly based on his auto. Well, it is based on his autobiography, but, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. I never saw that movie. <laughs> oh, it's great. I'm going to have to see that. It's a Spielberg movie? Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Is Leonardo, it, it Di that... Leonardo DiCaprio okay. is in it playing Frank it's, Abagnale, it's, and Tom yeah. Hanks is in it as the FBI agent okay, that is yeah, chasing it's, it's him. Okay, yeah, it's sounding familiar. I think I saw Trevor's It's really movie. entertaining. Yeah. Does, it have that, does it have that Spielbergian tone to it? It does, yeah. I, that I remember, yeah. Kind of the all-American tone, yeah. Okay. So I have, yeah, I've seen the movie. I actually read the book. Um, my friend loaned it to me. Because I thought I had it, but then I was like, nah, I think my friend Liz loaned it to me and I probably gave it back to her. But um, she, I think I read it probably in 2005 or 2006 or something like that. And then I watched the movie. So I actually read the book first and then saw the movie. Like some of the um, stuff that was in the movie or some of the stuff that was in the book, they didn't put in the movie, obviously, because there was a lot of shit in there they couldn't it put in there. And I will say that... I know this is going to sound funny, like, in light of what I'm going to say after that. But the movie is exaggerated, for sure, a uh, version of the book. But as we will discover, and I actually didn't really know this, because all I remembered of him was reading the book, Catch Me If You Can, and then watching the movie, and being like, wow, what a crazy fucking story that is. And, you know, we should do a show about that guy, because it's like a crazy story. But then, like, the more I researched it, the more... Um, tenuous everything became let's put it that way and uh, I actually didn't even really know about all that stuff like when I was thinking about doing the show so this actually was going to be like a more interesting show for me than I thought because I found out some shit that I didn't know mm. and, um, and the shit that I found out like actually goes back to the late 70s but I guess nobody really gave a crap about it until later on so there's that too I think maybe you put this in the bin to be voted on because this, this. I is, did, yeah. This this, this is what the uh, patrons voted on. If if you we are, we're always looking for more patrons. Okay, patrons actually keep the show floating because we don't really get that many super chats. The economy's kind of bad. We occasionally get a super thanks from the recordings, but we do the show because we love the show and we've got a lot of friends that listen to the show. Uh, but helping us out always fucking of course keeps the ball rolling that, that that jenny works real hard on this show doing all the research graphics and shit so um i forgot where i was going with that i'm fucking about uh, i'm just getting started in my mind anyway the uh uh i think what happened was is that we were talking about a con man that had fascinated me i wanted to know more about him it was a guy who was pretending to be a doctor yeah he learned how to be a doctor by reading fucking manuals and the dude became a surgeon and a good surgeon. He practiced for years at his own practice. It wasn't until many years later that he got busted that he didn't have a medical license. He wasn't a doctor. He, he was self-taught. Yeah. 
which checks out on so many of the fucking things that I've learned as I got older about, really, man, those universities don't mean shit. The guys who actually learn things are guys who fucking study it themselves, and you don't really have to be in that university. If you have access to those books and willpower and intelligence, you can learn all those skills for free. And that's what that dude did. I think he learned it in prison, if I remember correctly, or started to learn it in prison. Learned all about the human body and how fucking surger- surgeries go down and how, what doctors do. And he became a fucking a doctor by his own hand. Illegally. Man. You gotta have some serious fucking balls to cut in and perform some kind of heart surgery. And I think he was doing advanced surgeries for the first time. Pretending that, you kind of, that you've done this before. And I think fucking talking about that, Jen decided that she was going to put this in the in the. Phone. Yeah, because this guy, um, okay, so this guy, and what we'll do is we'll kind of get into the story as he tells it, like in his book, and you know a little bit in the movie, but you know mostly in his book, because like I said, I did read that like um, a while back, and then we'll get into what probably really happened. Okay. So, um. So there's that. But the famous story about this guy, he did impersonate a doctor. He impersonated an airplane pilot. He impersonated a lawyer, a sociology professor, um, a cop slash security guard, like a bunch of stuff like that. Yeah. Um, At least that's, you know, what the narrative is, which we'll get into the specifics like as it goes on. But like I said, when I read his book, you know, and the thing about it is that, and he seems, he's still alive, and he still does, you know, lectures and talks and stuff like that. He has a um, company that's, you know, just Frank Abagnale and Associates or something like that, and he goes around giving talks about fraud and how to prevent fraud, because the whole thing about it is that his narrative is that he was this lovable rogue type character, um, you know, in his teenage years, because all of this shit happened when he was before he was 22 you know what i mean like when he was between the ages of 16 and 22 or so he claims so all of that happened then and then like he decided to go straight and he was actually going to help out the fbi yeah. like in combating fraud and now he like gives talks and has his own company and guy, everything like that stealing st- stealing private planes and flying around no was, okay that was a different one no that's there was not. another one the kid that was i think they called him the barefoot bandit yeah he just left barefoot footprints wherever he went. He'd steal people's private Cessnas and shit and just fly them from one airport to the next. He wouldn't take the plane. He'd leave the plane at the airport, of course. But he'd hijack your plane. <laughs> and he was a kid. I think he was 16. Yeah. And he, and he did not fly. He just learned it. Well, it's not so important to know how to fly as it is to, to know how, how to land. land. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the big he thing. He figured that out, too. <laughs> Well, good thing because you can't you can't really mess that up too many times. No, <laughs> he was a genius, but crazy. Well, and like I said, yeah. it does. I'm always kind of fascinated by people like con men like this, and I think that was what interested me about Frank Abagnale in particular is that, and particularly if you're reading his book, you're just kind of like, wow, it's like you're almost kind of like you don't condone what he did because he fucked over a lot of people. But you're almost like, wow, just to have that like confidence, like to just go in there and do that kind of stuff. But like I said, the narrative that he presents of himself and how shit actually went down is not the same. Yeah. So like I said, the the stuff that you see in his autobiography and that you see in the movie, it's a narrative. And yeah. he very much still um, benefits from that narrative. So he's not really as great a person. I, like I said, I kind of feel like he's trying to portray himself as like this good guy, Robin Hood type character. Oh, I only stole from big corporations. I never stole from a little guy and all this other kind of stuff. And then I turned my life around and now I help, you know, the FBI to really like combat fraud and stuff, which perhaps he does. But I think, it, you know, he kind of came through it through false pretenses. The ironic thing about it is that, you know, he's kind of like plays himself up as you know the world's most famous con man or something like that and i said and he kind of is but not for the reasons that most people think that he is you know what i'm saying so yeah which we'll get into but like i said this this turned out like a lot more interesting than i thought it was gonna be (laughs) because i was like his his book was like interesting enough but then like when i went back into all the shit i was like oh there was all of this stuff i didn't know about it 
you know, it's it's pretty fascinating. Okay, uh, for the regulars, you know that uh, I guess it was last week. Bought a car, bought a used car, got rid of Jenny's old one, got a good deal on the fucking Mercury Grand Marquis, 1999 with only 100,000 miles on it. That got that bitch running good now. Um, put new part, new plugs in it. it it's 90 something percent finish, 90 maybe 97 percent interior. It looks great. Low miles. Old lady car. Anyway, took it to the shop today, put four new O2 sensors and had Jenny drive it back. The car was fucking fast. That's why they call it the, the 4.6 liter V8. They call it the four-door Mustang. Well, some guys call it that because it's basically a four-door Mustang. I had the other Mustang. That I had a real Mustang for a while, but it's basically that same car. It's only a couple hundred pounds heavier. And man, I was impressed driving that thing. It's quick. But I'm going to make a video on it when it's done. I got to do. I gotta put some old, uh, U-joints in the drive shaft and I'm going to recover the, the header, the ceiling header. I got all the fabric coming and everything. going to do that. It's going to be sweet when it's done. going to put a new navigational system in the console, get rid of that old tape deck. It's going to be showboat. I may even put Mustang wheels on it. Bullet wheels, maybe. We'll see. It's looking good. I was thinking about putting 4.6 badges on it like a Mustang. Like a luxury Mustang. It'd look cool. <laughs> yeah. A that AC is just blowing. The big old American car, big old fucking American late 80s, early 90s fucking air conditioner system with fucking two pounds of coolant in it. It blows ice cubes now. Fucking good. Jenny, you enjoyed it, right? Yeah. You like, you like, what did it feel like driving? Well, I don't know. It just kind of felt like a much fancier version of my Ford. Of the Ford Taurus? Like yeah. faster. Faster, more like a, more like riding on a cloud kind of yeah. feel. Real smooth. I liked it. Because, I mean, you know, it's older than my Ford, but yeah. it's like in a lot better shape and has fewer miles on it. Yeah. That, that, that car stayed exactly like that up until 2011. Yeah. That's when they discontinued them. But there's stuff that you can do to that. There's all kinds of fucking upgrade up, upgrades. I got some new fucking headlights for it that are LED that are ten times brighter than the stock old fucking headlights. Because out here in the country, man, we can barely see driving in, 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 in uh, around these fucking yeah, new cars. Yeah, there's like no... Um, Can't see. Yeah. And there's really no streetlights mm -hmm. out here. Like in our neighborhood there is, but they're yeah. very dim. Yeah. But like out on the roads, they're just country roads, there's no lights. And the difference between 1990s headlights and fucking modern headlights is vast. You're you're blind compared to everybody else. So that's coming. It's coming. I'll do a whole video. You guys are gonna like it. it looks great. Murder Hornet said my dad has his private pilot's license and taught me to fly. I know yeah. how to fly, but I don't have a license. Murder Murder Hornet when he ran down to uh, Mexico today, went across the border. And every time he goes to Mexico, he starts giving me updates of fucking everything he's doing and all his preparations. That motherfucker acts like he's going to the moon every time he goes to Mexico. Dude, it's just Mexico. And he's like, he's like, yeah, man, but I gotta avoid them cartels. And shit. Like he's fucking funny, motherfucker, man. Case and Lee asked, sorry, unrelated question. What do you guys think of John Lear Jr.? John Lear Jr. Uh, John Lear Jr. Was that? That's the guy with the UFO guy, right? I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I'm not sure who that is. Yeah, I'm not sure who that is either. I mean, I'm sure I probably know, but I'm, I'm just blanking out on it right now. <laughs> just blanking out on it right now. So, should I look at... Man, my drink's already getting kind of... You want to make, 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 make it up? Yeah, make me another one. All right. Might as well, before we get like too far okay. into it. But, yeah, like I said, this was... I don't know how many of you guys have seen uh, the movie about this, which, like I said, is exaggerated. But, um... It's a great movie, though. It's entertaining. But it does say that it's based on a true story, and I don't think that's entirely the case. And I don't really know. Because every time I kind of see a discussion about this, because I looked at a bunch of different documentaries and everything about this, it's interesting because you see a lot of kind of documentaries about it that are, like, biographical. And some of them are just talking about the stuff that was in Frank Abagnale's book, like his autobiography, but they're not really going into maybe what the truth of the matter is. There's a couple that do, but it seems like most of them are just kind of like going along with his regular biography. If you go on like Wikipedia, it tells you like the actual 
<laughs> it tells you the actual story. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so some people are still kind of just going from the book, which is all that I knew about him. Like I said, I didn't really have some of when I read the book, I was like, some of it sounded like pretty far fetched. Um, but I didn't really have any reason to, I mean, you know, I didn't really care one way or the other. I just didn't really have any reason to like doubt it necessarily, even though some of it was like, well, that sounds a little out there. Okay. Which drama? The, the book. That's all. Which book? The book, the book that this, this guy, okay, yeah, yeah, about this guy. Gotcha, about Lear. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Case Lee says King of Conspiracy. Yeah. I mean, I've heard that name, but yeah, it's the UFO guy, says Danny. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't really know enough about him to like make a, because I don't watch a lot of UFO stuff, and I don't watch a lot of conspiracy stuff. I, I think he owns Skinwalker Ranch. Oh right, we did a show and, about and, Skinwalker and, Ranch. I think he got contracted uh, to look for UAP and everything to make the technology. Oh all right. UFOs. I don't know much about it. Um, I know the other Lear. If it's the same guy I'm thinking of. Just because the guy's rich and fucking intelligent doesn't mean he can't be a quack. Well, yeah. He, he, Anybody he can seemed, be a nut. Yeah, he seemed a little bit like a quack to me. But there was also, I heard that there was some evidence that he, that they were able to dig up. So, you know, who am I? I just don't know enough about it. I don't know. We did a show about Skinwalker Ranch and every single part of it sounded like bullshit to me. But, you know, yeah. that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> Everything kind of sounds like fucking bullshit. The Navy <laughs> and the government says that they're seeing UAP. They don't know what it is. But that's a different that's a different yeah, story yeah. than Skinwalker Ranch, though. Right. That's a whole different kettle of fish going on out there. And yeah, Danny said. Right. There's some compelling stories, but pilots, very, you know, fighter pilots and shit, very compelling. Tic Tac story. The videos that they show don't aren't you. The, whenever a dude tells one of these stories, like a Tic Tac story, they'll show a video, but that's not a related video half the time. He says, "Yeah, that's not quite it, though. That's a different video." Uh, so you know. The thing that they locked on that was that was that was parallax. There's a lot of the shit that I looked into. That the best ones are like a long time ago, like Jafari, Colonel Jafari, of the um, the old um, Iranian Air Force. That they they saw something and they scrambled him and some other guys and he saw a fucking craft. Big light came out of. He took evasive action. His, contr his fire controls went dead. And then later it was confirmed by. <clears throat> Spy satellites that there was some kind of a high, uh, uh, some kind of a high object moving at high Mach, and this is during a time when my grandfather was a contractor for uh, it was Grumman Aerospace, I believe. No, it was McDonnell Douglas. McDonnell Douglas at the time, because he worked for a lot of them, and he was working in Isfahan, Iran. He helped build the Shah's Air Force F-14 Tomcats. My granddad engineered a lot of the F-14 Tomcat, mostly like the fuel injection system. So he was over there with a team of guys from McDonnell Douglas to train the Iranian Air Force how to maintain that shit. He was friends with the Shah. He knew him. But then that revolution happened and Ayatollah Khomeini took over. But um, half of my family, they're American, but they lived in Iran, Isfahan, all my aunts and stuff. My grandmother, my grandfather on my mother's side. And my granddad was half, half a Syrian. He was an Assyrian Christian. His mother was. So I have Middle Eastern ties on my mother's side. But anyway, that UFO case was one of the best ones because it was confirmed by an American spy satellite. There was something moving at high mock that they were chasing. And they didn't have the ability. Nobody had the ability to move at the mock rate. We're talking about like Mach 8 at that time. So it was fucking incredible. Okay, so let's get into the actual topic. So what I'm going to do is I'll kind of go into the story as he tells it in his book. Uh, the book, like I said, came out in 1980. I believe he had been working on it for a few years, like starting in 1976 or something like that. When he had like a ghostwriter or a co-writer or whatever. And... Um, so it came out in 1980 and it was kind of like a big bestseller. It was like a big sensation and everything. Like he was known before that because he had been on TV and stuff, but we'll get into that. So this is his version of the story. And then we'll get into, like after we get into that, we'll talk about probably yeah. what actually happened. So 
One thing that is true is that he was born in 1948 in Bronxville, New York. And he had three siblings. One was older, two were younger. Now, according to him, when he was 16, um, he gets he's at school and they kind of, you know, come to him and take him out of class. And they told him that your parents are getting divorced. Like, you have to come to the court. Or what, I don't know if it was the same day or whatever. But it's like you have to come to the court and decide which one you want to live with. Which, again, sounds a little weird. But, okay, I don't think they would really do that. But, all right. Now, they did put this scene in the movie, and it's like this big deal and everything. So, in his book, he says he's 16. He goes there. They're like, oh, well, you have to decide if you want to live with your mom or your dad. Um, he can't decide. So, he decides that he's just going to run away from home. So, like, there's a recess in the court or whatever, and he just takes off and leaves. And apparently, he d he never sees his dad again, and he doesn't see his mom again for, like, many years after that. So, he just, like, takes off. So, the story goes that he goes to New York City, like, on a train. And he gets there. I believe he gets a job, but it's kind of, like, a kind of a, you know, a, a bullshit shitty job because he's 16, you know what I mean? And quickly realizes that you can't really live on that, uh, especially in New York City, probably not anywhere. So he starts writing bad checks to supplement his income. And he starts getting away with it. So he figures, well, why even have a job when I can just do this all the time? You know what I mean? Um, and he was making like pretty okay money. But evidently he was getting kind of worried that the cops were maybe going to catch him or they were kind of, you know, getting wise to whatever he was doing. And he hits on this idea. According to him, he said he was walking past a hotel one day and he sees like a flight crew like coming out of the hotel and those, you know, they all their uniforms on and they all looked really spiffy and everything. And this gives him the idea. He's like, you know, if I looked like if I had a uniform and looked like an airline pilot, I could probably like pass bad checks and no one would get suspicious. You know what I mean? Because everybody's like, ooh, he has an important job and he has a uniform and blah, blah, blah. Like he could probably pass shit off more than just looking like a regular motherfucker, right? So he decides, um, yeah, I'm going to start impersonating an airplane pilot. This, this is, like I said, this is the story that he's telling. So he decides that he's going to pose as a Pan Am pilot i don't even think pan am are around anymore are they no gone. but they but they were real big back in yeah, yeah. back in the day this was in huge. the this was in the 60s yeah so um so what he decides to do he's like okay well i need to get a pilot's uniform now even though he was 16 at this time he always like looked older than his age he's real tall and uh you know kind of big so he did kind of look like an adult he could pass for an adult you know what i mean so what he decides he's, he's like okay well i need a pilot uniform so he calls up, like I said, this is kind of, ha if this really happened the way he described it, which I don't think it entirely did, but if it did, I mean, this would take some incredible balls and confidence. I would just never, I, I mean, I don't want to scam people anyway, but it's just kind of like, I would never have the audacity to like do shit like this. <laughs> You gotta be a little bit of a sociopath. Or yeah, a that's what I mean. Psychopath. You, really. you kind of do. And I'm yeah. not, so I just can't imagine like doing any of this you gotta be real co so confident that it's, you're crazy yeah i could do this shit step aside <laughs> you gotta be super arrogant but you also have to be skilled you have to be intelligent enough to be able to deliver on this yeah so I d and you definitely do have to because um if you guys know i mean probably you know there's a guy on youtube dr grande and he does he's like a psychiatrist and he does breakdowns of different you know celebrities serial killers all kind of different stuff and it's he did one on this guy and he was talking about how this is probably some kind of narcissistic personality disorder which yeah. i think um real highly of yourself yeah and and also he seems kind of fantasy prone also yeah. he's just very much like um talking about how awesome he is like yeah. not super overtly but like one level down yeah. from overtly you know what and i mean if i say you got to think highly of yourself you got to think highly of yourself. well yeah I'm because arrogant yeah exactly Jenny, why is that light is that light supposed to be facing here or is it supposed to be facing that way did you turn it oh i you know what i Sorry. think um oh because i had to i was using the um the postal scale okay so it probably just you actually look pretty good though it probably got turned around you look pretty good the way it is i mean around. you do look a little bit shadowy but 
that's might not have anything. That's good. Do. I don't look as flattened out and fucking. Yeah. Okay. Just, that looks good. Well, that's Put some fine. Shadow on me. Yeah. So what he does is he calls up, like the Pan Am, like corporate, right? And he says, "I've okay." So I've heard different, and I and it's been so long since I read the book that I don't remember exactly what he said. He either said that the uniform was stolen. Or that he was at a hotel and the and it was at the dry cleaner and they had lost it. That's what he said. So he's like, so I need another uniform, like, right away because, you know, before my next flight or whatever. And it worked. Like, they were like, oh, okay, right away, sir, blah de blah So they send him to this, like, uniform company where they got all their uniforms from, which was in New York City and wasn't that far from where he was staying. And so he goes and gets it. Now, he also has to get, like, a pilot's ID. Um, I think he actually forged that, at least according to him. And I'm not sure if it was this, but there was a scene, and I remember the scene in the movie, too, and I remember him talking about this in the book, where he might have either done this for the ID, for the pilot ID, or for the checks, I can't remember. But he went to, like, a hobby shop and bought, like, a model Pan Am plane and, like, peeled the decals off like the logos and stuff and then like use those to like make a forgery or whatever it was like i said it was the 60s um you know the technology was not all that great so it's just and i think people were a lot more trusting also like if you basically said hey i'm a pilot this is my id like i don't think anybody would question it like everybody's a lot more suspicious nowadays probably and rightfully so because of shit like this but we're not a high trust society anymore well i mean well the thing about it was that in a way, I know kind of people like lament that, but I was just like, yeah, but look at all the shit that people got away with, like back in the like so many fucking people got murdered and shit like yeah. that in the '60s because of that, because they were exploiting like people being trusting of people. You know what yeah. I mean? So it yeah, it's just the '60s though it went all the way back to. That's forever. what I mean. Well, yeah, but I'm just saying that when yeah. people talk about oh the good old days and all this other kind of stuff, I'm like, there's no such time. No such thing. Yeah. <laughs> there's no such time. It's like people have always kind of been awful. Not uh, not most people, but there always have been awful there people. Ev- there's evidence of serial murder in this country going all the way back to the 1600s. Just mysterious fucking grave sites underneath houses where, you know, people were killing travelers and shit and staying, taking their money. There's all kinds of yeah, shit. Yeah, I mean, there was just... And, and honestly, like I said, I could argue that it's probably better now than it was back then because now you, you can't get away with back it. then you could get you could get away with pretty much anything. Like yeah. I said, you just move to the next town and nobody would yeah. be the wiser. Yeah. Look at how long this mother... Well, the thing about it is that Frank Abagnale, I keep wanting to say it's like, oh, look how long he got away with stuff because in his narrative, he did get away with stuff for like years and years. But in real life, it didn't really work out that way. You know what I mean? So, like I said, we'll get into that. Vincent says, if his father did operate a stationery store, which, yeah, I think he did, um, he could have learned some aspects of forgery if he worked at the store. Yeah, I think he did. And like I said, from what I remember, because I'm I'm really interested in, uh, like, art forgery and stuff like that, like the techniques of it. And so... I remember being really interested in that aspect of the book where he was talking about making the fake IDs and making the fake checks and like putting the little logos on them and like how he did it and stuff like that. Like I was really interested in that. So I think that that, but I specifically remember that he went to a hobby shop and bought like a model Pan Am plane kit. You know what I mean? And it had like the little decals on it that had like the logos and he used that like to make an ID or whatever. Wow. So, uh, so there was that. So now, so he has a uniform, he has an ID, and um, and like I said, he's 16 years old. Now, contrary to popular belief, he never flew a plane. What he would do was that he would go into, and he would never go onto a Pan Am plane because he was afraid he would get busted. Yeah. So he would go to another airline. He's like, I'd go in the airport, I'd look at wherever it was I wanted to go. Yeah. You know, this, you know, where it's transatlantic or whatever, trans, what the fuck? I almost said Trans Am. Yeah. Trans Am. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly a Trans Am yeah, yeah. to Chicago. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. But yeah, so he would go into another airline and he'd be like, hey, can I get a deadhead is what they call it. Like you're a pilot, but they let you ride in the jump seat. For free. Like in the cockpit yeah. for free. So what he, I really need to get there. Like, you know, do you have a thing available? I think you have to fill a form out and shit like that. But if it was available, he would take it. So he never flew a plane. 
he basically would just go in there and go wherever he wanted to go for free like without having to pay like he'd have the uniform on and be like hey yeah i need to get here and there and the other thing you know what i mean so he did that so doing that at 16 right (laughs) or so he claimed yeah i don't know so like i said we'll, we'll get into it um but he said in his book that between the ages of 16 to 18, like those two years, that he estimates that he flew over a million miles, like or, like around the country, around the world for free. like, And that's how he would do it. He would just walk in and be like, hey, I'm a pilot and I need to do this, you know, I need to do this flight. And they'd be like, okay, we got, we got the jump seats available so you can take it. So yeah. And that's what he would, that's what he would do. Now, <laughs> so here's the thing. Now, so he did that. And he supposedly did that, like I said, for two years. I think the only reason he was doing that um, was just to get from place to place. He was forging checks and shit like that all the time, too. Like, he did that pretty much the whole time. I don't know if he ever had what you would consider a real job. You know what I mean? It never seemed like. It always seemed like if he just needed money, he would just, like, scam somebody out of money or like steal somebody's checks and like right, right, some fucking bad right and just write some bad checks that's kind of how he funded his lifestyle oh, okay so <laughs> yeah which i th- which that part of it is true but i just think he exaggerated it something in the book so he's 18 years old in 1966 and he decides at this point for whatever reason i can't really remember what his justification for wanting to do this was he decides that he wants to, he's tired of being a pilot, I guess. And um, he wants to be, he wants to pretend to be a, a doctor. Uh, actually a pediatrician, like to be specific, is I think the doc, the type of doctor that he was. So at this point, he was living in Georgia. Might have been, I don't think it was Atlanta, but it was somewhere in Georgia. And it so happened, I don't know if he had decided that he was going to pretend to be a pediatrician and then he met his neighbor who was an actual pediatrician or if like he just got the idea from that guy probably got the idea well because i think one thing that i one thing that i was watching said that he had already decided it and then when he met his neighbor who was an actual pediatrician he was kind of freaking out a little bit because he's like oh he's gonna bust me but it turned out that the dude like didn't really like to talk about his job or anything like that so they could just talk about regular shit but he kind of makes friends with this dude who lives next door to him. And the dude is like, yeah, well, you know, um, we have this doctor like or a resident or whatever, and he's going to be out for a week. And he works overnight and he just supervises like all the night shift people. And it's like, do you want to fill in for him? So apparently uh, Frank's like, yeah, OK, I can do that. <laughs> How do so, you get paid? Well, see, that's another thing, too. I always just kind of wondered about that. But like I said, you know, I think that the reason that a lot of the details aren't in here is because a lot of the shit didn't happen the way he said that it happened. You know what I'm saying? They could have just written him a personal check, but it didn't sound right. Yeah. It didn't sound right. I mean, well, if you're, I don't know, if you're just coming in temporary and you're just, because I'm not really sure, because I know that doctors and nurses, like, will fill in for other ones, like, all the time, like, if they're in that particular town or something so i figured they got to pay them somehow but i don't know how they do it maybe just pay them like a contractor you know i would assume they gotta pay pay you in some kind of check that's what i'm saying well like nowadays have a bank account yeah like right and then on that fucking check that you or excuse me on that bank account they're probably going to expect to see your name with doctor in front of it right when that shit doesn't happen they're like wait hold on why didn't why doesn't your bank account say doctor on it yeah and it just sounds fishy we'll see yeah so apparently so he said that he was gonna do that so he was like working i think it was the it was like midnight to 8 a.m or something like that and while he was there like he also had access to the medical library so he would go in there and like read books and like you know try to sound like he knew what he was talking about now at this point too he also again he comes across as a little bit well not a little bit a lot arrogant Like I said, not so much like I'm the most awesome person ever, like Tom on trend, (laughs) like, because that's what he was talking about, but just like, but like a notch down from that, you know what I mean? So he will say stuff like, you know, oh, well, I read all the, you know, medical books in the library and I have a photographic memory, so I didn't really understand all the stuff that I was reading, but I could rattle it off, like if anybody asked him, like, so he sounded like he knew what he was talking about, like he sounded like a doctor, you know what I mean? So... 
So evidently he's supposed to be there for a week. And again, just like, again, and I think that there's a popular misconception, just like when he was impersonating a pilot, people are like, what the fuck? Like he was actually flying planes. He didn't, he never flew a plane. He was just, like I said, he was just using it to get around for free. He didn't fly the planes. And the same thing applied with the doctor thing. Like he was basically just there supervising the other doctors and nurses, like just kind of telling them what to do. And it's just like, if somebody came to him, like if there was actually some kind of an emergency and they called him in there, like he would always just kind of try to get out of it somehow. Like he would try to deflect like, oh, well, I think you're better suited to handle that or something like that. Like he would always come across like that. So as far as I'm aware, and I don't think in his book, I don't remember him ever claiming that he had ever actually like fucking operated on anybody or anything like that. He always passed it off to others. So at least he had that much self-awareness that, you know, he knew that he didn't really know how to do it. And I'm sure he didn't want to get one, he didn't want to get caught. And two, you know, maybe he did have some semblance of, um, you know, uh, feeling in there that it's just like holy shit like i could kill somebody because i don't really know what i'm doing so as far as i know he never did actually like operate on anybody he was just like in a supervisory kind of role and like i said he would just kind of deflect everything like if somebody was like hey what do you think we should do well, what do you think we should do about it? So, you know it was that kind of stuff and apparently he was kind of charming and he would like tell jokes to diffuse situations and stuff and a lot of people were not suspicious you know what i mean now some people were but you know some people weren't so so he yeah so he's overseeing the the interns now evidently even though this was just as far as i'm aware even though this was only supposed to last a week um you know the the other doctor who was the neighbor actually came forward and said hey that that doctor that you were filling in for he's actually not coming back like he's moving away um, so you can stay if you want. So he did actually end up staying there for a year. But like I said, I don't think he ever operated on anybody because at least he knew not to go that far. Because I think he was just afraid that he was going to get caught, right? And maybe he did have a conscience in there somewhere where he was just like, yeah, I don't want to cut up somebody. And, you know, so he would just like leave it, leave it to the professionals, I guess. So he did that for a little while. So then he's 19. It's 1967. And he decided, you know, he's been an airplane pilot. He's been a doctor. Let's be a lawyer for a little while. How about that? That sounds yeah, like fun. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Sounds like yeah. fun. Now, he was living in Louisiana at this point. Like I said, I don't really know why particularly he decided to be a lawyer. I guess because of the money. But Good that Well, yeah, and I think that was kind of a yeah. big factor. Yeah. Girls would go, oh, man, he's a lawyer. Yeah, and I and funnily enough, I haven't seen the movie Catch Me If You Can for a while, but I do remember that they leaned real hard into, you know, him with all the like hot stewardesses and stuff like yeah. that. Which actually, he did kind of talk about that in the book, but I said it's interesting because that's actually probably a lot closer to reality than because the dude, this dude, they didn't really go into this in the book or the movie, kind of a creeper, to well, be yeah. honest with you. Um, <laughs> Which, yeah, which um, he didn't really talk too much about, but they did find out some shit about him later on where I'm yeah, just kind of so like... he was actually going for the perks problematic. of pretending to be some shit. Yeah. Like I yeah. said, I kind of think, at least according to him, that it started because, oh, well, somebody with a uniform or somebody with a real respectable job, they can get away with a lot more. Right, I right. think he initially just did it to, like, facilitate his, you know, check scams. Yeah. Because no one would question you, like, if yeah. you were a doctor or whatever. I put a suit on, I can get away with all kinds of shit. Well, she, yeah, and, and yeah. that is true. Like, yeah, if you yeah. look respect, you know, yeah, if yeah. you come in looking like a bum, nobody's right, just, yeah, yeah. everybody's going to be, like, totally sus. But it's like, you come in looking all spiffy and everything. Yeah. yeah. So I think that he did figure I gotta out. i got to buy out. a new suit. Yeah. I'll get some tailored suit and look like fucking Daniel Craig, fucking James Bond suit. <laughs> the fucking skinny, skinny pants and shit. Yeah, you got the money. Yeah, I got the money. Because you don't have a suit. Uh, anymore? No, not anymore. You just had. To I let them all age out. Those are like funeral suits and shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just we never have cause to wear them. We never so. have cause to wear them. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like you know we went to my stepdad's funeral, but he's just like I don't have a suit. I, I get a like, cool suit. It's like don't worry about just it. It's a cool dude suit. A cool dude suit. Yeah. I don't know where. Can, I'd wear can it. you get one that says "cool dude" suit yeah, on the so back? I have that shit on iron on iron on words on the back, this letters is, on the back. This is my cool dude. Suit. This is my cool dude suit. Yeah, that'd be fucking funny. 
You should totally do that. I know, what would I do with the suit? I don't know. That's what I mean. You never. <sighs> no, we never go one. anywhere to. Yeah, I don't need one. Like I said, the only reason you need a suit usually is for funerals. Well, my goth outfits were suits. Yeah. They were just a different kind of suit. Yeah. Yeah. Alice in Wonderland said, I have trouble passing the bar. I always stop for a quick one or six. Yeah, I, I know that feeling. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, so Frank decides he's going to be a lawyer. Now, it so happens that he had a female friend, girlfriend hookup. I don't know what, what the situation was. Um, he told her that he had a law degree from Harvard, of all places. I mean... You would think that you would just want to keep a little more low key than that, but no, he's going. He's go, he's going for the for the big score, I guess. He's just like, yeah, you know, I, I have a law degree from Harvard, sure, like like everyone does, and um, you know, I I need a job, so you know, you got any leads on that or anything? Now it so happens that this woman did actually either worked in the DA's office or knew somebody that did. You know what I mean? So she yeah. kind of had an in. So she's like, oh, well, I'll put in a good word for you. Now, interestingly, um, okay, so I guess there's some states in the U.S. Some states, you have to have, like, a law degree, and then you take the bar exam, and then you can practice as a lawyer. But some states, including Louisiana, you don't have to have a law degree. You can just go and take the bar exam, right, as far as I'm – and I don't think a lot of states you can do that, but Louisiana is, or at least was at this time. It's not know. normal law. I don't know about – only at that time. Yeah, like I don't know about nowadays, but yeah. at the time, you could just go and take the bar exam. You didn't have to have a I law lived degree. in Louisiana for a while. Yeah. In Mississippi from past Christiane. And uh, for if you're a foreigner, maybe you're just not from Louisiana – Louisiana is not under normal law. Most states are kind of law based upon British Commonwealth type law. Not uh, Louisiana. It's Napoleonic law. That's what it was based upon. Corrupt as fuck. Very corrupt. You're guilty until proven innocent. You know, and you, you lock them up, Louisiana. You don't want to get in trouble there. What Marilyn Manson said about Louisiana is totally true. It's just nothing, <laughs> and New Orleans especially. It's nothing but bars, cemeteries, and prisons. And you're going to end up in at least one of those. <laughs> yeah, you're going to end up in a bar, in a cemetery, or a prison. Yeah, Vincent said he convinced himself he needed a sense of arrogance so nobody would question his authority. Yeah, yeah. and I think, and that does help with certain kinds of people. Yeah. Like, if you just go in and look like you know what you're doing... Well, you know, there's a big joke that goes around. It's like you just walk in somewhere like with a clipboard, like yeah, and no one coffee, and, and a coffee cup, and no one will question and like yeah. look like you belong there. Yeah. Like you know, most of the time, no one will question you because like, oh, that yeah. looks official. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I can I think he figured that. If out. If you analyze some of the greatest men in history, they're they're like that psychos, kind of. Yeah. Mean, even though they're great, they're still psychos. George Washington was like that. Fucking uh, General Eisenhower. If he wasn't a general, you'd say he was a fucking narcissistic fucking, you know, lunatic. But no, he was a general. Very effective, too. But very arrogant, kind of haughty, wordy motherfuckers. And, I, you know, I think he would have been like that even if he wasn't a famous general. Well, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. just a certain personality, a personality type. type. Well, yeah. and the thing about it is that everyone that has that personality type doesn't necessarily get real successful, but uh -huh. they are still assholes like yeah, that. Yeah, they're assholes. And act like they're God's gift to Although, if they're competent, though, they can move up, and they kind of can con their way into higher positions. That's what I mean. It's like they're some competent. Of, so. Yeah, it, that's what I mean. It's like some people are just arrogant with no cause like they can't do shit yeah there's nothing backing it up and there's nothing backing it up and yeah. they don't usually they just go through life just being uh, assholes yeah but if you're an asshole who can also do something competently yeah. then you get a lot more leeway like people yeah. will still think you're an asshole and hate your guts but it's just yeah. kind of, they'll grudgingly be like well they yeah. can do that stuff so yeah i'm not talking shit about i'm not talking shit about washington or eisenhower they were great men they were also psychos they weren't they were very narcissistic but you have to be to do what they were doing. It's a weird... It, it, it's a weird... <laughs> life is weird, man. They faked it until they made it. But rock stars are like that, too. David Bowie was like that. I kind of feel like most people that yeah. get successful, you kind of have to do yeah. that. Yeah, you're to, faking to it until you make it. Right. Yeah. James says Harvard is probably about the only law school he knew of. Yeah, I kind of feel like that was... I mean, because, yeah. you know, he's, what, 19? Yeah. 
at this point it's like he probably never heard of any other ones i can't really even think of that many other ones now that i'm thinking about it but um you know case and lee says louisiana is in the bible belt sorry i'm from sri lanka the bible belt is not really a thing like it was yeah it's just the south and the south is basically southern baptists and southern baptists are very politically active and they were a majority in the South. So a lot of the, a lot of their, the laws that they passed here were, if it was Islam, it would be halal. Everything they did here was halal. It was like Sharia. In Mississippi, a lot of the counties were dry counties. You couldn't even ha have hard liquor there. You, you could have beer, but not hard liquor. And people from the other states, like California or the Northeast, saw the South as ultra-religious. But, you know, I was partially growing up in the South. She's from the South. You don't notice it if you're from here. I did. <laughs> well, it's not as bad as them, though. I saw that shit, but I didn't care. I'm from the... I was living in the fucking Mississippi Delta, the Deep South. Just because something was illegal didn't mean you didn't do it. There weren't any cops. You did whatever you wanted. Kind of lawless, so it didn't matter. Nobody took those laws seriously anyway because it was just virtue signaling. People that voted for it were just trying to make their wives happy. That's all. They didn't actually do it. Yeah, I mean, well, and you see that a lot in those real ultra religious yeah. kind of, you know, do as I say, not as I do type yeah. situation. They're all doing that shit right, behind yeah. closed doors. They wouldn't care about it so nah. much. No. Nah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's just kind of like you always see these crusaders against porn and stuff like that it's like you better search their fucking oh, yeah, they safe in their house because they got all kind of freaky right, shit yeah. going on in there you see a lot of the, <laughs> a, a the fucking anti-southern propaganda was coming out of the fucking california and it was the new york you know the northeast area and it's because those are very legalistic societies they care about law a lot rights and shit like that that didn't really exist in the south it, this was a, a, an honor-based society going all the way back to the 1800s. It didn't matter what the law said. You just did what you wanted. It was all for show. Like, for instance, it was very religious here, but it wasn't uptight. It was sexual as fuck. When I was a little... When I was young, Mississippi was fuckfest 1984. You know, fuck, like, what are you talking about? Hmm. Okay, so um, so he's going to go take the bar exam so he can work in the DA's office in Louisiana. Now, he said that he took the bar exam three times over a course of 13 weeks and finally passed on the third try and then gets a job as like the essentially the assistant attorney general is, I think, what the job was. And he later bragged that he ended up winning 33 cases even though he had never been to law school. Now, he supposedly stays here also in this job for about a year. But again, um, there's another guy who works in the same office who actually does have a law degree from Harvard, and he's like a little bit scared that, you know, he's going to start talking to him a little bit. He's going to find out that he's a fake, you know what I mean? So he's just like, all right, so I better get the fuck out of here. So at this point, it's 1968. Frank is about 20 at this stage. Now, at this point, he's he moves around a lot, obviously, um, because he's all getting in trouble here and there, and he doesn't want to get caught. So he just keeps moving from state to state, because like I said, back in the 60s and 70s, you kind of moved to another place, and they couldn't really catch you as easily. So in 1968, he's living in Provo, Utah. And for whatever reason, he decides that he's going to go to Brigham Young University and get a job as a sociology professor. Again, not really sure what spurred this, but he just decided that that's what he's gonna do. So he has, so he pretty much forges all of his credentials and he tells the dean, I believe, um, that it's like, oh, well, you know, I used to be a teacher and I really loved it, but then I went and became an air, airline pilot. <laughs> but I decided I wanted to come back to teaching and blah de blah So, According to Frank's story, uh, the dean was like super jazzed about this. He's like, oh my God, you totally have a, have a job. 
So he gets a job and apparently teaches a class. And of course, because like I said, he seems like to have some narcissistic tendencies. Um, of course, his class is like everybody's favorite. Like it's just the best class ever. And he's such a great teacher and blah, blah, blah. So again, he's here for about a year and then he starts getting worried that he's going to get caught. And so he decides to move on. So all of that, I believe all of that was in the movie. I don't remember if they put the sociology professor thing in the movie or not, but for sure the pilot thing was in there. The doctor thing was in there. I remember that being in there. The professor thing might've been in there too, but he did a couple of other scams that they talked about in the book that actually were not in the movie. One of the ones was that he got um, a security guard uniform. I'm not really sure where he's like, I think he just rented it from a costume shop or something like that. And he goes and stands in front of this bank in Boston. And he has this sign. He either wrote it or he had it printed out that said that the machine was broken, like the that you would, you know, do deposits on. And he's basically like, well, it's broken and they're working on it. So if you want to deposit any money, just give it to me. I'm the security guard and I'll deposit it for you later. And evidently a lot of people did um, fall for this, even though obviously he was just putting it in his own account. So that was like another scam that he said he pulled. Now, supposedly too, during all this time, and they leaned very hard into it. In the movie, Tom Hanks is pay is playing an FBI agent. Um, I think his character's name was Carl Hanratty. He's not a real person. That's like not a real name of a person that was after him. He's kind of like an amalgamation of several of the FBI agents that were after him. But the thing about it was that in Frank's book at this point, he's saying, oh, the FBI were after me because of all the crazy shit that I was doing. Um, you know, and he was like really being pursued and he was just constantly trying to get away from the FBI, like trying to stay one step ahead of them. So... You know, so that's another reason why he said he was always, like, moving around. And he had, like, different identities. I think even sometimes he would use different names. He sometimes used his own name. Um, but I think sometimes, too, he would use Frank Williams because his middle name is William. So I think he used that, like, as an alias as well. So, yeah. So he supposedly was able to evade capture for all of these years, even though supposedly the FBI were chasing him. So at this point, though, he's 20 years old and he decides, well, you know, I'm just getting really tired of being on the run all the time and like doing all these scams and getting worried about getting caught. So I think I'm going to go straight because he supposedly has all of this money in his bank account from all of these scams that he's been pulling. Right. So he decides he's going to move to France and just live a normal, straight life. So he goes to France and like he couldn't help himself like as soon as he gets to france and he went to sweden as well and he started pulling some fucking scams over there too just like check fraud that kind of stuff like like i said like he couldn't stop himself now one of the claims that frank made in his book and in his lectures like for a long he might still be making this claim i'm not entirely sure but he said that the only time that he was ever arrested in his whole entire life, this is supposed to be like really impressive because like, look, I did all this crazy shit and I only got arrested one time. He said the only time he was arrested was actually in France. And um, what had happened was that Interpol had issued a warrant in Sweden for like some fraud that he was doing there, like when he was 21 years old. And he was picked up by the French police and... Um, they figured out like about all of this they picked him up on the charge from sweden like the interpol charge but then they found out he'd been doing all this check forgery in france too so they threw him in prison in france now his story was that he was thrown in this prison in france for six months and it was like horrible like they starved him and he lost 89 pounds and all of this other kind of stuff and i don't know they... in a french prison yeah and i was just like I, okay uh, <laughs> so, I yeah. their prison is soft as fuck well, that's the thing. Well, I, like I said, we'll kind of get into it. But right. yeah, he said, oh, it was like horrible and he lost all his weight. And then he um, got extradited. Like after he got out of prison in France, like he got extradited back to Sweden. And then he served some time there for forgery also. 
So he's 23 years old when he gets out of prison in Sweden, and then he gets handed over to the FBI, and then they, you know, extradite him back to the U.S. Now, in the movie, okay, in the movie, this is a great scene. It didn't happen like this, but you kind of wish it had, because it's a great scene. In the movie, Tom Hanks playing the FBI agent, who, like I said, was not his character wasn't a real person. It was just like an amalgamation of like a bunch of different people. And they're so they're going to bring him back from Europe um, to the U S and charge him with some shit there. And he doesn't want to serve any time in the U S. So they bring him on the plane to take him back to the United States. He goes into the bathroom and pulls out the toilet apparatus and goes out through like a hatch in the bottom of the plane, like while the plane is taxiing down the runway and like jumps out the plane, like at the bottom of the plane and like fucking runs like hell. And that's, that's in the movie. Um, and like I said, it's is a that great, possible? It, we'll see. Okay. That, is, I, I'm, I'm not that was that. okay. But that's just, that was the movie. Okay. Yeah. In the book, he said that he got put on the plane and while their all their backs were turned he just ran out the through the galley okay, like through the yeah, kitchen yeah, galley that sounds a lot more because right, later on like after that movie came out people were like that's you can't do that you can't do some like shit you can't like that? that's impossible yeah. like you can't get out of the if you toilet can do that by hand that mean that that fucking plane is not airworthy because his well, yeah his, <laughs> his whole thing <laughs> right his whole thing was oh well i had been flying on these planes for free like all this time so i knew everything about no. planes cuz like i said he said, said he had a no, photograph there's something reason. called Construction and fucking like structure. I'd be like, yeah, I'm like, if you could just pull the toilet, yeah, that, structural integrity. You know can you I mean? imagine at thirty thousand feet, you're in you the fucking can? A, you can just pull a fucking and like it out, just comes just out and like out. sucks your ass out of yeah. the bottom of the plane. That'd if be you horrible. Could do it with your hand on purpose, especially probably a little skinny motherfucker like himself, then that means you could be sitting there taking a dump and hit turbulence and get sucked out of the fucking plane. That's what I'm saying. Just the floor. Of, Boy, that'd be scary as fuck. You're sitting there God, taking that would a be dump. The, oh my god. Or if you're a girl, you're peeing and all of a sudden. Well, a girl could be taking a dump too. She could be taking it. Girls don't take dumps. Yeah, they didn't <laughs> And then a fucking, the fucking shit hits a fucking the shit hits some fucking turbulence. And boom, and all of a sudden you just go boom and you're and you get thrown ass out of the first. aircraft. Out ass first. <laughs> Panties around your knees at thirty thousand feet. God, that'd be the Cold worst. Cold as a motherfucker. You've fallen. And it's it's high enough. You dick flapping. Yeah, dick flapping. <laughs> pussy fucking blowing. It doesn't matter. Pussy and you're flapping. fucking looking down, and you, for all you know, you're over the ocean. All right. And, and then you get eaten by a shit. shark. That's what would happen Cold to me. Cold as shit. You fall right into a shark's mouth. It's like waiting yeah, for you. Yeah, well, that's like my worst. You nightmare. better try to like peg out and get as skinny as you possibly can if you're over the water, and hope that you hit just right, because uh, hitting water. <laughs> At 30,000 feet, you're going to be hitting that at 110 miles an hour, at least. Uh, that's just a downward velocity. Forward velocity, falling out of a plane, that thing's going to be moving 400 miles an hour. You hit that water, it's going to be like hitting concrete. You know, it's going to kill you deader than shit. And shit is pretty dead. Deader than shit. Yeah, and shit is very dead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very rarely does a person survive a fall out of an airplane. It does happen. But very rare. But but it's so rare that when very it does rare. happen, it's like still because we talked about that yeah. woman that fell out of the airplane. Usually, the survived. only way to survive coming out at thirty thousand feet is you have to fucking hit a mountain with a slope on it. Usually, wet you have to hit some shit or, that'll break your fall or snow, and you have to hit the slope just right. And it, if you if you can see the video, you got to come down like that, and it slows you down like a parachute. If you can slow down to 70, you're fine. You just don't want to hit dead stop at 110. That'll kill you. Well, yeah. I've come off of motorcycles at 70, 75. But it's not a direct impact. Yeah. You got forward motion, so there's a lot of sliding and rolling. Rolling, yeah. So if Which you is have better than angle, just going splat. If you have an angle, like on a mountain, you can get the slide and the roll action, which will slow you down. But that was a woman that survived, and it was just very rare that that happens. She hit a bunch of trees, too, yeah. like on the, and then it was well, like no, a slope. No, there's more than one. Yeah. One of them just hit a, hit a hill the right way, and I think it had snow, or it was wet. The other one hit trees, and she hit it just right. It slowed her down some. Yeah. They, it was both women, I think, that survived. It was, yeah. I don't think it was men. No. 
I don't think any men have ever survived falling out of an airplane. It was stewardesses in both accounts. I think it was, yeah. yeah. Danny says, excellent detail on this character, Jenny, for tonight's awesome topic. Very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I got, like, real into it. Super chats are open. Jenny's open for tips. And you can also give her a super thanks. Thank you very much. I'm pimping you. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you, know, you know how you do. I'm looking shadowy. You, that's why I said that earlier. Yeah, yeah. You like that, though. Yeah. Shady. That's what you are. <sighs> <laughs> Allison said, Tom and Jenny, you guys must belong to the Mile High Club. No. We have never been never on been. an airplane together. No, only in a moving car. Yeah. Well. But no, Jenny was going solo on a moving car. We recorded <laughs> it. We never, made it. we never published the video. No, well, I think I published some of it. Yeah, that was on the other No, one. not that one. We did, no, we oh, never that's published a... the video where I was driving. Yeah. And you were in the passenger seat. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. But yeah, we've never actually been on a plane trip together. No. Jenny doesn't like to fly. I don't either. I used to fly a lot because, no, like I said, I, I used, like to fly. Jenny doesn't like to fly. I used to go back and forth to the UK all the time, but yeah. I hate flying airplanes. I love it. For that fucking reason, you might might get sucked out of the toilet and then get eaten by a shark. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like I said, that would be my fucking luck. But yeah, so it, it, okay, so it was a cool scene in the movie. It's a cool scene in the movie. Leonardo DiCaprio climbing out through the fucking toilet in the bathroom and then like dropping out the bottom of the plane and then running like hell across the fucking shit or whatever. Like I said, even, okay, so that was even an exaggeration from the book, which, spoiler alert, is excel, is itself a large exaggeration. In the book, he just said, yeah, I just ran out through the kitchen, like the little kitchen galley that they have in a plane. And he just ran the fuck out and just jumped out the plane and ran across the thing and jumped over the fence and got a cab and got the fuck out of there. But, um, but the toilet story is like way better. Now, another thing that he said, too, was that after this big daring escape that he made from the airplane where they were trying, you know, they brought him back to the U.S., um, he said, oh, my God, it was, like, such a big deal. Like, there were all these front page stories about it. Like, the media was going crazy and blah de blah Now, he gets picked up again by the FBI, like, after, I think he was only on the lam for a little while, but he got caught again. And at this point, he claims he was sent to... The Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, 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 why can't I say that word today? Penitentiary. And he was sentenced to 12 years. Now, okay, so his story about this. So he goes to the Atlanta Federal Pen. He gets a 12-year sentence for all of the shenanigans that he's been up to. And he says, so he gets led in there and he was kind of being, he said that he was kind of being treated special, I guess, because he's like, ooh, that's this big deal fraud guy and we just caught him and he, you know, escaped from the plane and it was this big deal and everything. So it gave him the idea. He's like, you know, some of the people, like when he got in the prison, like other people didn't really know who he was. So he's like, so I'm going to pretend that I'm a prison inspector, like a federal prison inspector. He decides he's going to do that. So he has, I can't remember like all the exact details of his plot, but he had a girlfriend on the outside and she went and got a business card from an actual FBI agent. And then she went and had and altered it. So the phone number on it was the phone number of like a, like a phone booth in a mall right and then she went to a print shop and was like oh my boyfriend's an fbi agent and i'm gonna surprise him with these new cards so they printed a bunch of, i mean you know like i said high trust society they were like okay fair enough so they printed a bunch of cards so then she brings this card to the jail to the prison and gives it to frank and then she goes and like monitors this phone booth so like when Frank says, hey, I'm actually a federal prison inspector. What am I doing in here? Like, call this number. <laughs> like, I'm an actual federal, you know, I'm, a, I'm an FBI agent. So then when they called the number, it was the payphone mm -hmm. in the mall. And the girlfriend was like, I'm the secretary of so-and-so. And yes, he absolutely works for the FBI and blah, blah, blah. And he said that that's how he got out that time um, by saying that he was a prison inspector and he wasn't supposed to be in there. And apparently they fell for that. So, uh, so yeah, so he apparently got out and he made a big deal about, I was the only person that ever escaped from this prison because it's super high security and all this other kind of stuff. Like I said, he's a little bit narcissistic, I'm going to say. So after that, 
this is Atlanta. So he runs off, but he goes back to New York City. And he was free for about a month. And um, But then he got spotted in front of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. So they recaptured him. And they sentenced him to 12 years in prison again. But apparently he only served four years, I think. And then the FBI came and said, you know, you are so awesome at what you do with all the fraud and everything <laughs> that you um, should help us. Like, come work for the feds and, like, you know, we're doing a fraud program and you've done all this stuff and you can help us, like, catch people doing this, right? And so Frank's like, yeah, okay, I can do that, thinking that he's going to get out, right? So this is 1974 at this point. He gets sent to um, Houston, Texas, by the parole board. And then that's where he kind of started doing, so he said, like consulting for the FBI. And he also opened his own business called Abingdale and Associates, which is essentially like a cybersecurity fraud detection kind of consulting firm is essentially what it is. And as far as I know, it's still in business. And that is apparently still what he's doing to this day. Like I said, he gives talks. Um, at various places about identity theft and about, you know, tax security and all that kind of stuff. Like, is he supposedly an expert on it because he spent so many years doing fraud? So apparently he's like an expert in it. And that's where we are nowadays. Like I said, he's still alive. He lives with his wife in uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. I can't remember where. One of the Carolinas. And, um, you know, they have a bunch of kids and he makes a bunch of money doing all these talks and doing consulting and everything. So that was his story. How much of this story is actually true? Like I said, when I read the book, I didn't really have any cause to question that much of it. Although I do admit that I thought, even at the time I was reading it, I was like, some of this seems a little far-fetched. Do you know what I mean? It did seem a little far-fetched to me, but I was just kind of like, yeah, whatever, like weirder shit has happened. Um, and again, like the movie is a little bit exaggerated too, but that's just going to happen. It's, you know, they always do that with movies. The thing about it though, that's interesting. And I actually didn't know this until I started researching this show was that people were calling bullshit on his story, even before his autobiography came out in 1980, people were calling bullshit on his story in the late 1970s but nobody gave a crap. <laughs> and like, I feel like people didn't really know about it. I feel like people didn't really know about it until recently. You know what I mean? Cause like the movie came out and I guess there was like maybe a little bit, I mean, he kind of went on the circuit and everything like that. Again, like when the movie came out, they republished the book. They did like a new edition of it and everything to coincide with the movie coming out. But it was crazy to me that people were calling him out back in the 70s but like nobody really like the, it didn't get any traction i guess like maybe his story was just too good and people just wanted to believe it so you know when a couple reporters came out and said um hey you know that couldn't have happened the way that he said it happened and blah blah, blah people were like oh shut up you know what i mean <laughs> like they didn't want to hear it so now that we've gone into his narrative let's discover what probably really did happen now here's what's interesting this is kind of how he became i don't know necessarily think he's a household name but he did kind of become nationally famous like i said back in the 70s the first time that he appeared on national tv as far as i know that like you know that a lot of people saw was he was on that old game show to tell the truth like in the um 1977 and that show it was on for a long time but what they would do was they would have, a, they, okay, so they would have a person on there that had some kind of crazy life story or crazy job or something like that. That He really did have that. And then they would have two other dudes on there or two other people on there that said that they had the same thing. You know what I mean? And then they had like panels, it was usually like celebrities and stuff that were trying to guess which one was the real one and which one was the fake, right? So Frank Abagnale was on this show in 1977. And the whole premise of the show was that if the celebrities or the panelists couldn't guess which one was telling the truth, 
then the person that was telling the truth would get five hundred dollars so frank abagnale was on this show in 1977 and they didn't guess that he was the one like they he he told the whole story like i just told it like all the stuff that was in his book later this was three years before his book came out by the way and um and they didn't guess that it was him so he won five hundred dollars so a lot of people saw that show and because they found his story so crazy they're like oh my god that's amazing he was like faked being a pilot and he faked being a doctor and he faked being a lawyer and he does that's so ballsy and they just they thought it was like really cool so i feel like audiences wanted to see more of him so he kind of started doing you know the tv circuit back in the 70s so he was on the today show he was on the tonight show when with johnny carson like more than once um and he was a really popular guest and so in those three years between 1977 when he was on to tell the truth and like 1980 when his autobiography came out like he was on tv all the time so i kind of feel like he was maybe not a household name but a lot of people had heard of him because his story was so fascinating and again, I think he was trying to sell the narrative that, yeah, I did all this stuff back in the day and I scammed a lot of people like because he wrote bad checks and everything like that. But I'm a good guy, really. I just did Robin Hood kind of shit. I only stole from like big corporations, um, you know, or rich people. I never screwed over like any little people or anything like that. And I went straight and now I help protect people against people like I used to be. So... Like I said, I think people kind of felt like, oh, he was like a lovable scamp type of character. And that seemed like the narrative that he was trying to push, right? Um, at successfully, you know, because he did actually make a lot of money from his consulting thing. But the thing about it was that even back in, there were a couple of reporters, there were two or three reporters in particular. And they saw him on either to tell the truth or the tonight show and they got interested in his story and they were like that kind of sounds like bullshit so they decided that they were going to do a deep dive right and they were going to like write a story about this guy and like figure out how much of this his story was true because it sounds pretty outlandish like when you hear it so two separate reporters wrote pieces about him and they came out in 1978 like basically saying like all of this shit that he said, it's like, there's no way it could have happened like this, but nobody cared. Like it was just kind of like, it came out and like the stories essentially went nowhere. So, you know, his book came out, he did all the tour. And like, I kind of feel like people forgot that, um, that he had been called out. Like people didn't really want to know, I guess. So let's start out with what really happened. And this is from the, um, you know, it, the two reporters that did the initial pieces and uh, subsequently, like in recent years, like there have been other reporters, like one guy just wrote a book, I think a couple, just a couple years ago, um, that's all about that, that's all about this. And he kind of goes even deeper into the stuff. So it's like people are still working on this case. So what was it that really happened? Now, he was actually born in, in Bronxville, New York in 1948. That part is, that's true. But even from the beginning, he's telling some bullshit stories <laughs> because he said in his original shit that when he was 16, you know, they pulled him out of school and said, oh, your parents are getting divorced and we're taking you to court to decide which one you want to live with. That did not happen. Um, his parents actually separated when he was 12 uh, and they got divorced when he was 15. He did not get asked which one he wanted to live with. He actually went and lived with his dad in Mount Vernon, New York. And his dad actually remarried not too long afterwards. So he lived with his dad and his stepmom. Um, you know, it wasn't a kind of thing where it's like, oh, I ran away and I never saw them again. That did not happen. So, yeah. So he lived with his dad and stepmom. Now, when he was 16, he actually lied about his age and went into the Navy. Now, um, so nobody really knows why he went in there. They thought maybe he was trying to get away from his parents or something like that because he had started doing like petty crimes and petty scams, like even from a teenage. That is true. Like he was a scammer. I'm not saying that. Um, but he's like, he was kind of getting in a little bit of trouble. So he went and joined the Navy. One of the first scams that he'd, one of the biggest scams that he did as a teenager, 
And again, this is kind of like he's trying to sell the narrative that it's like, oh, I only stole from faceless corporations. That is also bullshit because one of the biggest games he pulled as a teenager was against his own dad. His dad, whose name is also Frank Abagnale, but senior, um, he had a company and he had a gas card, you know, like a credit card. And he gave his son the credit card so he could, you know, put gas in the car or whatever. And what Frank Jr. figured out, what he figured out that he's like, oh, well, you can buy other things at this place, not just gas. And they also sold other stuff. So he started a scam where he would go and buy stuff like car parts and things like that at the gas station with the gas card. And then he would return them for cash. So he would get the cash, but then it would just go on the dad's credit card. So the dad would be stuck with the bill, right? That was the big scam that he was. And eventually he racked up in back then money, $3,400. Do you want to know how much that is in today money? 30, 33 400. grand. That's wow. 33 grand that he racked up that his dad kind of ended up. I don't even know if his dad ended up having to pay it, but his dad's like, I'm not paying that shit. Holy shit. But that's what, that was one of the biggest scams that he ran when he was a teenager. He fucked over his dad. Like his dad gave him that credit card and he would just like scam to get like all this cash and then left his dad stuck with the credit card bill. So he did that. 33 grand. So that's nice. Um... Now, he was only in the Navy for three months um, and was discharged. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, and when he got out, only a couple days after he got out of the Navy, he was arrested. Like I said, remember he said in his lectures and everything, I only got arrested one time in France. That is also bullshit. He was arrested lots of times. Um, he got arrested only a couple days after he was out of the Navy. He got arrested in Mount Vernon, New York. Um, for petty larceny. Um, and then a month later, and remember how I said that he's kind of a creeper and they kind of left this out of the book and the movie because they were trying to make him seem like a lovable rogue? Yeah, let's hear some creeper stories. Um, well, it gets worse than this, okay. but one thing that he did in 1965 was that he went to a house and said that he was a police officer uh -huh. and he went in this apartment and he said, I'm investigating your teenage daughter. Okay, yeah, this is And like good. what okay. yeah, like okay. and like went in there. Now the person went, in there, went through her underwear drawer. <laughs> it's well, yeah, it was like I don't know if he did that, but it's like that sounds like some shit that he's like <laughs> yeah, building up to. Where's her underwear? Where's her? Right, yeah. We we need to go through her, her panties because Get any pictures of, of her, I gotta turn these pictures in to the fucking headquarters. <laughs> yeah. It's like, come on. <laughs> yeah. Now even back then in nineteen sixty five, um, you know, the person started to get suspicious. It's like, this seems a little fishy to me. So um, he actually called the Mount Vernon police. So the cops came and found him still in the apartment. He actually had a toy gun on him and a badge that he'd made out of paper. <laughs> a badge he made out of paper? Evidently. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. You mean like a cop badge? Yeah. That he made out of paper? Yeah. Paper or cardboard or something. I'm trying to imagine this. <laughs> How do you make a badge? Can you paper? imagine that is uh, that is butt. even lamer yeah. than Steven Seagal's "Hey, I'm going to test you for breast cancer." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and fucking Steven Seagal was a master at testing for breast cancer. Fucking, it was I mean, Shiatsu. come on, Shiatsu. He could find a lump. Come in there with the paper police badge. I need to see your teenage daughter's <laughs> underwear immediately. Seagal could look at a woman and sense that maybe she had a lump, which would call him to the breast. Yeah. That that you know that that's how good he was. Yeah. Why do these dudes wrote. think they can get away with this stupid <laughs> crap? I mean, come on, it's like so transparent. Because movies. I guess. Because movies, they were making. Because it works in movies. Yeah, yeah, no, they make movies, and when you make movies, weird shit works. Because people need jobs, girls need to work. So it's like, like, yeah, yeah you might this, hire me. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be hired by Steven. That Seagal. would never work in real world. I don't even want to be in the same room with it, Steven. It only Seagal. works like in. Hollywood. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, because that's kind of <laughs> Yeah. But yeah. So um, so he got arrested. Now, they charged him with vagrancy, which I guess seems like a little bit of a weird charge. But I guess that was just what you charge people with. Because what would you... I mean, you would think impersonating a police officer, surely. Right? 
Yeah. Like entering somewhere under puts. Why vagrancy? I'm not real sure. But that's what they charged him with. Um, and he was identified, like the victim identified him. It's like, yeah, that's the motherfucker right there. Try to come in here. I don't know if he went in there, looked in her underwear drawer, but I kind of feel like that's probably what he was doing, right? I mean, it seems like. Yeah, he was only, he was 16 or 17. Way. He was 16, 17? Was... Yeah. Wait a minute. No. No, no, I'm not buying this. He's claiming to be 16 or 17 and talking his way in as a cop. Yeah. Past her parents. Well, like I said, he, now one thing that he is, he was a big dude. And he did look a much older than because yeah. he got he got into the navy when he was sixteen. Nobody really questioned his age. He did look much older than his age. Huh. So there okay. was that. So he did All get right. away. He looked like an adult when yeah. he was a teenager. Because I've seen pictures of him from that age, and he did look like an. He could <laughs> See, pass. He comes into her room and he's going through, the, smelling all the right. Clothes. <laughs> I gotta go to the restroom. Man. Well, I do too, but it's just like, man, you've been like fuck for like five I'm times. I'm drinking more than you. I'll be back. I haven't, I haven't been, and I'm just kind of like waiting. But yeah, so he gets arrested for vagrancy. Now, so the next day, um, he goes to court, and they were basically like, well, <laughs> they actually sent him to a psychiatric hospital for observation. So there was that because obviously they knew something was fucking wrong with this motherfucker, right? Now, so I guess he was there. I don't know how long he was in the psychiatric hospital because you don't hear about him again for like a few months, right? So I don't know if he was in there that whole time or he just went and they said, yeah, he's fine, let him out or whatever. But a few months after that, in June of 1965, he was arrested again. This time, he was all the way across the country in Eureka, California. What he had done was he had stolen... Like, back in New York, he had stolen his neighbor's Ford Mustang. It was yellow. And had driven across the country to California. And basically had, like, to finance the trip, he had stopped at this little, like, family-run auto repair business. And while their back was turned, he stole a bunch of blank checks and wrote checks like while he was driving all the way across the country. So again, his claim of, oh, I never stole from small businesses, again, bullshit, because he stole thousands of dollars from this small business by stealing all their checks. And he also stole the car belonging to his dad's neighbor. So there was that. So yeah, so he drives all the way across the country with the checks in the car, but they arrested him in California. Now, he had also, at some stage during this adventure, um, had also impersonated a U.S. Customs official. So they charged him with that, too, but I guess they didn't have enough evidence for that because they dropped that charge. But um, because the car had been stolen in New York, they transferred the case back to New York, even though he was arrested in California. Now, what ends up happening is that his dad comes out to California to pick his stupid ass up. He's 17 years old at this point. And him and his dad fly back to New York from California. And it was at this point, while they were on the plane, that apparently Frank had the idea to start impersonating a pilot. Now, he didn't call Pan Am corporate or anything like that. He actually just bought a uniform from a uniform company in Manhattan. Uh, and the money that he used to buy it was from all the forged checks because that's pretty much how he made all of his money, right? Now, he said, so he buys the uniform and he said that he had graduated from, you know, the flight school, the pilot school in uh, Fort Worth in Texas. And before he could perpetrate this scheme, though, he was actually like only a day or two after he bought the uniform and was like, yeah, I totally went to pilot school in Fort Worth. He got arrested again for stealing checks in another uh, city in New York called Tuckahoe. So he stole some more checks there. So he didn't even get to do the pilot thing full on. You know what I mean? So because of the check stealing, he was sentenced to three years out of prison in Comstock, New York. Now, he actually did serve two years in prison and then was let out. They let him move back in with his mom. However, while he was on parole, he stole yet another car in Boston and he got thrown back in jail again. 
So he gets let out in like on Christmas Eve, 1968. He's 20 years old at this point. At this point, he dresses up as a pilot, a TWA pilot, not a Pan Am pilot. And he moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Now here is some more creepy stalker shit. So what he did was that while he was on the plane flying to Baton Rouge, he was on Delta Airlines. And I guess he had met this Delta flight attendant in New York. Her name was Paula Parks. And he's flying down there. She's on the plane and he apparently becomes smitten with her. So she, and it's funny because I saw one documentary that said, um, that Paula remembered him because he smelled really bad. <laughs> he smelled bad. I don't, she didn't specify like what he smelled like, but I was just like, what are we talking about? Like onion breath or like he smelled like he'd shit his pants or what kind of, what kind of smell are we talking about? He just smelled like, like real, had, real bad BO or yeah, like he had fucking, fucking taken or a something. Problem. Yeah, so... But he, uh, he thought she was great, though. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and... Okay, so this is pretty weird, too. So so he's kind of in love with her, I guess. On the airplane flight, he's not in uh, love yeah, with her? Yeah, I okay. guess. Well, I, I don't know if he had known her before. Okay. but Or if he just met her on this flight. I'm not entirely sure what the timeline is there. Now, when they land, he offers... He's like, I'm going to take you and all the other flight attendants. We're, I'm going to take you all out to dinner. And so he did. And then the next day, he sends Paula, like, a whole bunch of chocolate and flowers and everything like that. He's simping. And, yeah. yeah. And so, and is like, hey, come have lunch with me. She wasn't jazzed about it. She's like, oh, it's the stinky guy. You know what I mean? But she was just like, oh, well, I guess. Okay. It, she felt bad, like, turning him down, I guess. And so then she says, like, they have lunch. And then she says, oh, I live in Baton Rouge. You know, if you're ever in the area, you can come visit me if you want, which was probably the wrong thing to say. I'm not blaming her. I'm just saying. Yeah. A few days later, Paula, because like I said, she's a flight attendant, so she's kind of all over the place. So she is actually going to go back home to Baton Rouge. So she's taking a flight back home. When she lands at the airport, Frank is at the airport waiting for her in Baton Rouge. And she's like, what the actual fuck? She found out later on that he had gone behind her back and talked to another employee at Delta and figured out what her flight itinerary was. Creepy. That's creepy. That is stalker behavior. Back in those days, they would probably just considered that to be very fucking committed. That is stalker behavior. Yeah. Well, yeah, they didn't know shit back then. Yeah. They didn't know shit back then. <laughs> Look, before you go on, just for, say where you are. That, uh, last night, it was the night before, me and Jen were watching some old silent films on... Was that Netflix? Um, I think it, I think it was HBO Max, like the Criterion Collection. Yeah. What the Harold Lloyd ones? I gotta get Her, it. Yeah, him. his name is Harold Lloyd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very, guess, he's famous. He's a good-looking guy. He had his like good-looking girlfriend, and they're doing these silent movies. I guess out in California, and they're funny. They're 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 good. You can relate yeah, to them. Right there. Yeah, but in the girl said that she was fucking surrounded by simp's. And this is back in the fucking 1920s. She, it was spelled out on the board, simp. I thought that was a new word. Because I'd never heard of that before, but it turns out. Dudes were call, <laughs> chicks were calling dudes simps back in the 20s. And she was uh, getting all these simps fucking... <laughs> fucking trying to give her gifts and fucking chase her down and shit. You're courting her. But uh, he evidently was making movies before Charlie Chaplin. And uh, we were watching, uh, we, we binge watched a whole bunch of little silent movies. They were only like, you know, five, ten minutes. And uh, they start off fucking terrible. You know, <laughs> French movies, Journey to the Moon or Voyage to the Moon. It's like watching a damn stage play. There's no camera angles, there's no close ups. But by the time Lloyd was fucking showing his movies, they were doing close-ups and shit. And that was a long time ago. That was over a hundred years ago. But uh, it was funny because they're like coming off as real people, people you could hang out with. You know, they're at speakeasy clubs, jazz clubs, and shit. And yeah, it was silent, but it was 
fun movies. She, but I was saying that they called the dude a simp. She was calling dude simps. She did. She used that actual word. She used the word simps. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, on the it's a silent movie. Yeah, they yeah. used it in the I was like, in the, inter- the the title card thing. I didn't realize that was over a hundred years old. I was like, yeah, that's a that was a pretty common yeah word. I don't know how common it but was. They have it all they, remastered and digitally remastered, and they did the uh, yeah. They, Criterion they, has all the yeah, Criterion editions of them, and they uh, did the adjusted the frame rate so it looked like video. So it looked normal, yeah. Yeah, it looked normal. And what's so funny is that those people have been long dead, man, and they did that shit over a hundred years ago, and just how normal they seemed. They seemed like real people. We re- actually really liked all of the, because yeah. um, we, like I said, for some reason we got into like a silent film. We still need to watch Hexan. I've seen it, but yeah, I want to see Hexan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we were watching like all the old like George Melier stuff, like Trip to the Moon and Infernal Cauldron and stuff. And then um, I was like, oh, they got all the Harold Lloyd stuff. I said he's kind of like a Charlie Chaplin ish kind of like yeah. you know physical comedy. And um, I don't think I had ever seen any of his stuff, even though I'd heard, I knew who he was, like, you know, because he's quite famous. Not as corny as Chap- Chaplin, not as stunts. He didn't have stunts. Yeah, but great physicality. Great, great physicality. And, like, honestly, we watched, they, they're not long. They're only, yeah. like, you know, 10 minutes or something like lots that. Lots of sexual innuendo. And we watched a bunch of them, and they're yeah. still fucking funny. Yeah, and lots of sexual innuendo. <laughs> they're still funny. I thought okay. they were still They go funny. to the jazz club, and her dad is trying to track her down because the, the dude took her there, and he's like, no, she can't be in there. And he gets there, and fucking the jazz chick fucking puts the moves on dad. Fucking like, and he's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm into this. Even though stealing her, she and then she fucking uses that to fucking blackmail him. Yeah. (laughs) After she's like, mom finds out, fucking you hooking up these jazz chicks, you're gonna be sleeping in a doghouse. You need all the money, and she's gonna kick you out. You know, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it was just like, wow, shit hasn't changed that much. Not really. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Cool flicks. Cool flicks. Yeah. Yeah, it's just I mean, funny how they had cool people throughout all the ages. I had a lot of fun with those. Yeah, yeah. Because, like I said, I'm glad I got to see some yeah. Harold Lloyd because I'd heard of him, but I don't think I'd ever seen any. But of But I never movies. heard of Harold Lloyd. Never yeah. heard. Of, she Jenny introduced me to him. And a good looking guy. Yeah, he's he a good looking guy. And I guess the the leading lady must be his girlfriend because they're constantly kind of like portraying. They, well, yeah, and I mean they were in a bunch of those a bunch of movies, movies together. together. And she's cute, and she you look at her and she just looks like a normal woman normal young lady you'd meet today you know but just good personality she looked like people you would know it's yeah. funny because it was over over 100 years ago yeah people don't change not really yeah Alice in Wonderland said he met her on the flight yeah see that's the impression that I got too yeah I thought he had just met her on the flight and was like oh you're the one for me or whatever so yeah so she lands. Yeah. Can you imagine? You just meet this motherfucker like one time, and it's just like, yeah, whatever. You're ever in town? Look me up. Like you don't really mean that, right? And um, so, but you land, and you don't, and suddenly he's there, and you're like, how the fuck did he know? Like I said, that's some stalker shit right there. I think back then it wasn't as alarming, but now it'd be like, woo woo, like red flag. You know what I mean? It's like I'd be fucking terrified if that happened. Like I said, if you're in a relationship with somebody for a long time. And they surprise you at the airport. Yay! That's that's awesome. That'd be awesome. Like, look, look, honey, I showed up and blah blah blah. But it's some bitch you just met. Fuck that. That's creepy. So, so she found out later that another Delta employee had told him what her schedule was, which she was probably like, "Thanks a lot, Carl or whoever it was that did it." And um. He's like, oh, well, I was supposed to fly today, but, you know, I got the day off. Like, my flight was canceled. So, woo, let's go do something. And Paula's like, um, help me? So she's like, no, no, no. Um, I still have some other shit to do today. Like, I got to work and I can't uh, do nothing with you today. Sorry. And um, so she was trying to blow him off. You know what I mean? Kind of hoping that it's like, please just let him go away. But that didn't work. Um... He actually did this, he pulled the same stunt, like, several more times. Like, three or four more times. Like, he would keep showing up, like, at the airport. And, um, so there was that. So she was starting to get a little freaked out. Now, so at one point, like, so he keeps doing that, and she keeps kind of trying to blow him off. And one time, though, he finally, like, essentially harangues her into, let me drive you to your house. And she was just kind of like, oh, God, no. And then she was just, okay, fine. Will you please just leave me alone if I let you drive to my house? So listen to this crazy shit. 
So he drives her to her house, goes in there and makes like instant friends with her parents and is basically like, they, cause I think like her dad or something like that, I think, I think his name was Bud and he was like real into fishing and shit like that. And he, so he's like appealing to, oh, it's, oh, you should teach me how to fish and be like, oh yeah, man, you should come over and blah, blah, blah. So apparently the, her parents fucking loved him. They thought he was just the most charming person ever. And it's like, oh, you can come over however you want. And it's like, so he ends up essentially moving in with them. That's how charming he was. I get, well, to them anyway. <laughs> so he would like cook for them. He would buy them presents. But the ironic thing was that he was buying them presents with money that he stole from them because he took their blank checks. <laughs> And then he would go out to the store and be like, look, I brought you this. And they'd be like, oh, that's awesome. Like not noticing that like, it's like, hey, I thought I had more checks than these. Where'd they all go? You know what I mean? So he was like stealing from her family. Like he moved in with them. And she was just kind of like, fuck me raw. It's just like, what the f Cause she couldn't stand him at this point. He was creeping her out, yeah. but her parents thought he was the coolest thing since sliced bread. And so he's like living there. And she's just like, please make him move away. You know what I mean? It was like, oh, oh, what an awful situation that must've been. So that whole kind of thing was going on. Like I said, and he was also stealing money from them too. Um, another thing that he did during this time period, which is again, a little creepy. I don't think it went anywhere that we know of, and I'm not gonna make any allegations, but I'm just gonna say what happened and you can make your, draw your own conclusions. So while he was living with this poor girl's family, because <laughs> her parents just loved him for, for whatever reason, he um, makes friends with the reverend, like the, the, the local church, right? And Frank says to the Reverend, oh, I'm really like, I really want to work with children. Which again, that's a little bit of a red flag. Nowadays it would be. So the Reverend, whose name was Earl Underwood, he um, is like, oh, well, I'll introduce you to, I'll introduce you around. So Frank, because he can't help himself, said that he had a social work, like a master's degree in social work from Ithaca College. And um, I'm looking to work with, you know, vulnerable kids, kids with intellectual disabilities, stuff like that. Again, red flag. So, so the, the priest guy, um, Underwood, introduces him around to like all these different, you know, people at the university and everything like that. Um, it seems that the people in the university were immediately like, this dude is a fake. But the reverend um, was kind of like, kind of to bat for him at first but then he's like well wait a minute like what are you doing here and shit he's like oh well i'm a twa pilot really but i'm out of work and i'm furloughed so i'm looking for another job the reverend started to get suspicious at this point so he actually called the airline and they're like abignail who like who are you talking about so at that point the reverend bless him uh he actually called the cops so abignail got arrested again in 1969. I don't know how many arrests this is, but it's more than one, because uh, one was what he said he got arrested, and this is definitely way more than one. So he gets, um, the initial charge was vagrancy again. Um, once he was arrested though, they found out that he had rented a car in Florida and driven it out of state, and also that he had fake um, employee identification, like from the airline, which again, you know, not legal. They also found out, like I said, about the checks that he had stolen from the family that he was staying with the parks family. And he had also stolen some checks from other businesses around Baton Rouge. And so he got brought up on more charges, forgery and theft. He couldn't pay his bail. So he was, um, convicted in June of 1969, but he only got 12 years of supervised probation. Also, they, they said that he had to get psychiatric help, <laughs> like on that condition. Yeah. But again, he was like, fuck that. And he let, and he split and he actually went to Europe. So all the shit about France and Sweden that I said before, all of that is pretty much true. He did actually go to Sweden at first in uh, late summer of 1969. Um, 
And while he was there, he did perpetrate a couple of small scams. Um, he actually ended up living with this dude, like scamming his way into like free rent from this one dude. And um, also, you know, scammed him out of a few hundred dollars. And then he went to like another auto repair shop and he went to the shop with a car um, and he said, you know, I want you guys to fix this, but can I rent a car in the meantime and from you? And they were like, yeah, sure. Like they didn't really have any reason not to, right? It was pretty common. And so he rented the car and then he just took off with it. So, you know, he stole another car and he drove back to France with it. He drove to France with it in, uh, from Sweden. So Fr uh, the French police actually caught him pretty quickly. Like I said, all of his allegations of being like a master criminal and he's just like, he never got caught all this time. That is bullshit. He usually got caught like almost immediately, like when he was doing this stuff. So he steals the car in Sweden, drives to France, um, and he got caught for forging checks in France, like within a, a very short time. So he did get arrested in uh, Montpellier, France. Like, you know, that, that part of his story was true. But um, the part about him getting sent off to prison for six months and, like, losing 89 pounds and stuff, that was bullshit. Um, he actually went to a fairly nice prison and was there for only three months. Yeah. Like, he didn't lose 89 pounds. He looked just the same no, French when he prison would have been came a out <laughs> as he did when he get, went in. Yeah. Now, he got out of prison in France in January of 1970, and then he was extradited to Sweden for the charges there. And he did... Um, he was convicted of forgery there as well and served two months there. And then Sweden said uh, they banned him from the country for eight years. And they also legally told him that he had to pay back all of the victims that he had scammed uh, in Sweden, but I don't think he ever did that. Now, he did get deported back to the U.S. In, he did do an appeal, but it failed. Um, so he got deported back to the U.S. in June of 1970. Now, it was at this part in the story, like I said, where, you know, in the movie, he escapes through the airplane toilet. And in his book, he said he ran out through the kitchen galley. All of that is bullshit. Um, he basically just flew back to the U.S. And it was kind of fine. He didn't really get nobody. I mean, Interpol was not looking for him at this point. Like the FBI knew who he was but he wasn't like a big fish it was just kind of like small theft and forgery shit so it's not like he was some big like international major criminal or anything like that um you know there was nothing in the papers or nothing so he's kind of, so he comes back he's 22 years old and he kind of like moved to North Carolina for a little while because like I said I guess they didn't really do anything to him in the US and like I said he didn't escape from the plane or anything like that he just came back and it was normal so he goes to North Carolina and it was at this point that he decides he's gonna um, do some scams on Pan Am and he didn't do it like by dressing up as a pilot he had dressed up as a pilot but for TWA the Pan Am thing, he was just going to forge um, payroll checks is what he was doing. He did get a Pan Am pilot uniform. He later said in his book, and I don't know if I mentioned this before, but he said in his book that he had scammed Pan Am out of $2.5 million, like in fake checks. That is not true. He did scam them out of some money, but it was more like $1,400. It wasn't $2.5 million. They're like, yeah, we would have noticed if it was $2.5 million. It was like some... I mean, you know, that's not a nothing amount, but it's not 2.5 million. So what he would do, he put on his pilot's uniform and then he would go, he didn't fly planes or anything. He would just go around to different college campuses and then, you know, passing these um, Pan Am checks that were fake, obviously. And he would say, again, because he's a creeper, oh, I'm here to recruit um, flight attendants, stewardesses for Pan Am. <laughs> that's what he was doing. Yeah. And according to some people that were at some of the campuses, he would do um, physical exams on, on the recruits. <laughs> because of course he did. Of course. What does that entail? I'm not entirely sure, no, but no. I'm sure we can probably imagine. Like I said, Steven Seagal doing breast exams. Yeah, I yeah. kind of feel like... <laughs> Well, we have to make sure see. that your breasts are buoyant <laughs> enough. <laughs> They must for for 30,000 feet for the altitude that you're going to be flying at. Because if they're Damn. not buoyant enough, then, you know, various things can happen. You need large 
pendulous and round breasts or very pointed upturned breasts because of G forces. Yeah, I'm sure he had some kind of fucking line. The G force involved in flying and the acceleration. Accelerational forces. (laughs) 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 Sorry, I just had I had a really funny like mental picture of like tits just like flying on either side like (laughs) in the wind. In the wind tunnel. He sets up a fan and blows on the and he goes, now turn, turn Yeah, turn to the side. Turn the other side. That would not surprise it would not surprise me at all. Hold on, let me see. Let me see. Yeah, it's like you pass. You, <laughs> you pass. He's gonna <laughs> checking the weight of the dudes, this man. They will ball. get. They will just this try to get away with anything. As fucking shady as it is. Like I said, I don't know if that's exactly. We're we're just speculating. <laughs> we're just speculating that's about what I would have done. Well, see, that's, that's what that's so, why because that's, that's like that sounds like some shady. Something like that's probably what he did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, because like I said, He's like bend over. Okay, now right. Shake your. Uh, Shake, shake your shoulders side to side. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> put put them on the scale. <laughs> put the right one on the scale first. Put the left one on the scale. We'll see. Okay, yeah, they're they're, they're not overweight. <laughs> Just well, you know, some crazy shit like that. <laughs> you're flying through a tube at like thirty thousand feet. It's like there's a lot of physics involved. A lot of physics involved, and we're not really sure like the effects of the female breast like at the this altitude and the turbulence. Sure. And then fucking upon landing, that rapid deceleration, the negative g forces. You know what I mean? Fucking what happens when the when the breasts shift forward? Will your nipples invert? Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, it might. <laughs> something bad might happen. You never know. We're gonna have to test. Yeah. Yeah, so it was probably some shit like that. I mean, maybe not, but it's that sounds like something he would do. Crazy. Yeah. So yeah, physical oh, examination. What's up, Zach? Yeah, he was in here earlier. He's been yeah, in here okay. a while. He's been in here a while. Said reminds me of a girl I heard complain about her period once, and she said my boobs are just useless spheres of spheres of pain right now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm aware. I'm I'm well aware of that emotion. I didn't. My boobs didn't usually hurt during it, but weirdly my. My legs did, like my thighs really hurt. If they did, I'd be massaging them for you as they feel much better. That doesn't usually help. Actually, yeah. nothing helped. It didn't help, no. Nothing helped. Well. <laughs> That's why I'm glad I don't fucking have that shit anymore. It was awful. Don't my they... first wife fucking wanted sex. She said that helped. Um, sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. Okay, yeah. It depended. Okay. But usually, I mean, You're usually. Like, okay, hold on. I put my gloves on. Yeah. All my fucking shirts. Okay, we're gonna do this. Getting your red wings. Yeah. Well, usually, I mean, the usually the first and second day, I just I felt too shitty. Yeah. Like I just yeah. felt horrible. Like I couldn't even stand yeah. up straight. Yeah. You know, I can't even stand up straight, and it's just like my stomach hurt. I didn't feel like eating. I didn't feel like yeah. doing anything. Like I yeah. felt like I everything was bloated i couldn't even put my shoes on i couldn't like you know my feet were too big for my shoes it's like you could put bracelets or rings on or anything like that because you just you felt like the michelin man so you didn't really feel like super in the mood is you know what i'm saying like the first day or two yeah okay but i mean but everybody's different They're, yeah that's just kind of what no. happened though. well my ex was in her 20s yeah it might have been different but and anything. and just her she would go crazy she was like no i gotta have it I mean, she I said it would yeah. like alleviate it. Yeah, I can see that. And like I said, I think at some periods of my life, yeah, it did kind of right. have that. But yeah. like I said, most of the time, I felt so shitty yeah. that I was just like, all I wanted to do is like just lay in bed in a, yeah. in a fetal position and scream. I never had it, so I don't know what it feels like. <laughs> and I have a high pain tolerance, so would, you know that if I'm that's the weirdest suffering, thing. that was the weirdest thing. it's thing. bad. Is that fucking? Tiff fucking liked pain during that time. Hmm. I guess it kind of offset it somehow. Maybe. Endorphins. Yeah, that's probably the harder what it was. the better type yeah. of deal. Yeah. Weird. It is weird. I didn't question it back then. I was just like, okay. <laughs> if that's what it that's what you want, that makes if that makes it better. Yeah. Yeah, I can't believe this. We're going on the gynecology all this cool fucking show. Well, Zach brought it up. It's his fault. Yeah. I'm Zach, just, Zach, don't. I'm just that. I'm just kidding, Zach. Yeah. Don't they tell you not to fly with breast implants or something? I have heard that. Um, yeah, I think there have been very, 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 very rare cases where one, like, it didn't explode, but where one, like, burst or something. But 
I don't know. I don't know if that's really enough of an issue to worry about. But I haven't looked into it for a long time, so I wouldn't know. I don't actually think I've flown in a plane since I got mine, so I don't really know. <laughs> so I don't know if it would be... I, I, don't, I wouldn't worry about it at any point, at any stage. So, um, so yeah, we got off on the whole... <laughs> I see, I, like I said, whenever I, you know, do all these notes and stuff and read through all these notes, I'm always just kind of like, I know the points where we're going to get distracted. And I knew that conducting physical examinations of these supposed stewardesses was going to be a point where, because I got distracted because I was imagining it's like, what the fuck could that entail? <laughs> like, what the hell story was he giving them? Because like I said, I was thinking about the whole Steven Seagal, I'm going to test you for breast cancer kind of bullshit. So it was probably something like that. So yeah, so he did that. Um, and like I said, he also forged a bunch of paychecks. Like I said, it wasn't $2.5 million like he claimed later on. Um, it was actually about $1,400, $1,450, something like that. It was like 10 checks or something. Because he said it was, didn't he say it was like a fa like thousands of checks? Or he said it was a fucking shit ton, but it wasn't. It was 10. And it was like $1,400. So... Pan Am found out about the checks. So they, at this point, called the FBI. And the FBI, um, a couple weeks later, picked him up in Georgia. This is November 1970. Now, I guess he had done, he had um, been doing some shit, because he'd been going all over different college campuses, Georgia, Arizona, shit like that. So they were, at first, only arresting him for the Arizona checks. So, you know, because this is all Pan Am. So he was going around to different places and it was all Pan Am checks. So at this point, he the judge sentences him to 10 years in prison. Now, at this point in his narrative, this is when he said, oh, I got sent to the federal uh, pen in Atlanta and, you know, I was the only person to escape from there. You know, and he said he pretended to be a prison inspector, right? And, like, they were dumb and they let him out or whatever. Um, okay. He did escape from jail. It wasn't the federal pen, though. It was actually just Cobb County Jail. And he didn't pretend to be anything. Basically, what happened is that they brought him in. The cops turned their back for a second, like, to do some paperwork, and he just ran out. <laughs> That's all that happened. So he did escape, but it wasn't as dramatic as he made it seem like. And it was not from the federal pen like he said it was. It was just a county jail that he, and he just ran out the door. Um, so there was that. And so he escaped and he went back to New York City. But four days after his escape, he got arrested again. He's in New York City standing by a pretzel stand and two cops saw him and recognized him. Because he had been, you know, arrested in New York, too. And the story goes that one of the cops, like, saw him there, recognized him, and just said, Hey, Frank! And he turned around. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was like, oh, shit. And then, like, gotcha. They, yeah, and then they went over and arrested him. Yeah. Um, so because he had escaped, he already had a 10-year sentence, so they added two years onto that. However, um, he served three years... And then Louisiana had a warrant on him and said, well, you know, let him out and we'll put him on supervised probation, right? And then he gets sent to Houston. Now, after he gets sent there, he's kind of out on probation and he did a bunch of different jobs or so he said. Um, and, but he kept getting fired when they found out about his criminal history. Now, in 1974, he pretended to be a pilot again to get a job at a summer children's camp in Texas, which again, a little sus that he's kind of wanting to work with kids. I'm not implying anything. I'm just saying it is kind of weird that he keeps doing that. Um, although, I mean, there were no allegations that he did anything with the kids. However, he did steal a bunch of shit from the other people working there. So that was something like cameras and money and stuff. So he got arrested for that, too, from stealing. Like, again, he, he just keeps saying, oh, I only stole from big corporations. That's bullshit. He stole from just regular-ass people and small businesses all the time. So he just got a fine for that. And then later, he got another job at an orphanage 
in Houston and again pretended to be a pilot and said he had a master's degree and like faked his whatever his whole job there was he had to like find foster homes for the kids that were in the orphanages now his parole officer actually found out that he was doing this crap and kind of went in and was like get the fuck and what are you doing like got him out of there and actually his parole officer moved him into the apartment over his garage so he could like watch what he was doing you know what i mean because it's like you can't trust this motherfucker um then he got a job at etna and uh he got fired from there too because of guess what check fraud he just can't stop himself like i said now, according to everything that the reporters could find out, um, that this parole officer was maybe instrumental in, like, telling him, hey, maybe you should, like, turn your life around. So, what happened at this point? He was not approached by the FBI or feds or anything like that, like, to help them. Like, oh my god, you're the best fraudster ever. We really need your help. What ended up happening was that he either approached... A local bank or the local bank called him i'm not really sure i've heard uh two side two you know versions and he basically just said to them oh well i've done all this stuff with check fraud and everything and it's like let me talk to the people that work at the bank so they can um so you know i can help them like identify like check fraud like when it happens right and he said I, you don't have to pay me anything um you know, if if you don't find the, it helpful, you know what I mean? But I'm just going to come in and talk to them, and you don't have to pay me. But it's like, if you do find it helpful, then just give me 50 bucks and just give my name to other banks, like, you know, word of mouth type thing. That's apparently how that happened. And this eventually grew into him going around to different banks and talking to them about check fraud because he knew a little bit about check fraud even though like i said he wasn't great at it because he kept getting caught you know what i mean it's not like he was some master criminal that got away with it for 20 years and then was like aha you know he's like fucking yeah. like he was a genius he kept getting caught you know what i mean even back then when right. they didn't have all the shit that we have now so he couldn't have been that fucking good at it. But, uh, but apparently he they... He just persisted. He just kept doing Yeah, it. he just kept doing it. Well, I yeah. guess, like I said, because he didn't really want to have a real job. It seems like... I feel it. One of his... I I, yeah, I get that, too. Yeah, I understand. But, but <laughs> I mean, no, will, nobody, wants to, to jail. nobody yeah. wants to have a real job. Yeah, like, yeah. real jobs suck. You know what I mean? Yeah, so that's, it's just, why, that's why they're jobs. Right. <laughs> that's what I mean. It's like if it was, it was cool, they wouldn't pay you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So I understand that. I understand that impulse. But I think, too, that and I, you know, people have even asked him this, too. It's like, you seem like an intelligent person. And like, you know, why didn't you just go legit? Because he probably could have had a job if he wanted. He probably could have had a decent job if he wanted to. I mean, I guess he does now because I guess he's has money now. But I don't know. It just seemed like it, it almost seemed like a compulsion, to be honest with you. I think that he just seemed like I think he just liked to see what he could get away with. Mm. It seemed like he just seemed like that type of person to me. But so yeah, this him going around and talking to banks is apparently what started his whole career that, you know, now he does everywhere where he just goes and speaks and he's like a, you know, like a consultant and he started his own business where he talks about identity theft and tech security and stuff like that. Um, I will note, though, that he, he, again, he couldn't fucking help himself. Even when he went around to give all these talks at banks, he said on his resume that he had done this stuff for Scotland Yard and the LAPD, which, again, bullshit. He didn't do that. But he told everybody he did. So, yeah. So his whole story was that, you know, as we mentioned earlier, between the ages of 16 and 22, he had pretended to be a pilot and a pediatrician and a lawyer and a sociology professor and a security guard and all this other kind of shit. But the reporters found out they're like, well, even if that was true, they're like, when he was between that, when they ch pulled all the public records and everything, they said when he was between the ages of 16 and 22, there were only 14 months of that period where he was not in jail. <laughs> so they're like, so that really would have, because he was in jail most of that time. So they're like, that would have really been amazing if he had been able to do all this stuff. Because he said, oh, I worked at this hospital here for a year and I was a lawyer for a year and stuff like that. They're like, you were in jail almost all of that time. Hmm. So there's like, there's really no way that that could have happened. So there was that. Um, 
So yeah. Now, as I said, he does still have his company, uh, Abagnale and Associates, which, and he still gives talks and everything like that. I've seen some that were like pretty recent, but there were some other things, you know, and here's just like some little fun facts that the reporters kind of brought up about some specific claims that he had made. Remember when I said earlier, I think you were in the bathroom, but like where he had like rented a security guard uniform and like stood in front of a bank. And people would come up to make deposits. He's like, oh, the machine's broken. Just yeah, give just me the money. Me. Right. Yeah, like Earth. he would do that. <clears throat> um, the bank that he said that he did that at does not exist. Oh, uh, so lied. They found that out <laughs> later on. Um, yeah, that bank doesn't exist. Uh, he also said that he had worked as a pediatrician, again, at the, at, he specifically said Cobb County in Georgia, the general hospital, and that he had supervised the residents. Um the reporters found out that that uh, hospital did not have uh, residents ever. Um, Pookie has joined the show. Hi, Pookie. She came up here to be picked up. To come on the show. she's like, put me up. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, Pook? What you want to say? She's like, I'm. Gonna jump. She's gonna jump back down. Wee. <laughs> she does that. Look at Tom. Boobs in atmospheric space are distracting. Yeah, yeah. I well, they're that. they're only distracting. Oh, yeah, 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 you did. Yeah, yeah. Who's that's in that's outer your space. Name? They're distracting. In, in atmospheric space, oh. they're distracting. Not not to not to. It's just they're just distracting. They're he just said, distracting. Yeah, R.C. Clark said it. Why are boobs so distracting to dudes? It's just like it's very funny. Dudes are programmed to be like, man, those are some good boobs. <laughs> Focus. But booty too. Booty also. They're just. I'm boobs. a boob man and a booty man. They're just. I like, boobs. I like them both. You have every men have them too, just yeah. not as big. Some guys aren't, don't care about one or the other. I'm a, I'm a both guy. He's a both guy. Yeah. He's a boob and a butt guy. Yeah. Ira says... I can't help. And feet. Well, feet. Not so much feet. Shoes. Shoes yeah. are better I was going to say, you don't really like feet. You like... Sh- I like feet. You like, like shoes better and feet. shoes. I like fucking real <laughs> painful looking shoes. Yeah. Yeah, he loves heel. like the more uncomfortable, the better. Yeah. Like, yeah. especially good if I can't walk in them. Yeah. Although he tries to make me walk in them, and I'm just like, like, I can't, dude, I can't walk yeah. in these. I'm I like them, like, they gotta look like some BDSM things. Yeah. <laughs> just, you know, I was born with it. <laughs> I can't Maybe he's it. born with it. I Maybe it's Mabel. It, yeah. Iris said Pookie is too cute. She is. She knows yeah, it, yeah. too. Both our kitties are, actually, all three of our kitties yeah. are cute. All three of our kitties are Beijing's cute. Beijing's feeling better now. Yeah, Beijing was kind of, did we mention that? She was kind of sick. Yeah, I gave her steroids. She got a lot better. Yeah. Her ass. Now she's wrong. now she's eating out. out. Yeah, she was, she's, she's eating, eating out, everything eating in the damn fine, house. Yeah. She's uh something's wrong with her ass. She had the ass gland problem. Yeah. yeah. Pookie had that once too, but yeah, she got it wasn't too bad. Like I gave her some like pumpkin powder, like fiber and stuff, yeah, and it went away, it went away. But um, sometimes you got to go to the vet and get that taken Cat care of. Cat food is not well-rounded enough. You got to give. Yeah, you have to. Like I said, the pumpkin powder works really good. Yeah. I still have it in the refrigerator. You need to start giving that to uh, Babby. Yeah, I probably should like mix that in with the fruit. I'll probably get some new because I think that one's kind of old. I'm gonna get some new. I don't remember how much it was. Um, but yeah. So, okay. So, and then there was the whole thing about how. He worked as a lawyer for a year and that he was, um, that he worked in the DA's office. He was like the assistant, whatever, the assistant district attorney or the assistant something. Um, and the reporters called that office up and were like, again, Abagnale who? Well, like they didn't know who he was. And also he's like, yeah, I worked on the second floor of this building and that building didn't have a second floor. So there was that too. Um, Also, he said that he was a sociology professor at Brigham Young University, and that he said, oh, he just went in there and talked to the dean, and they gave him a job, like, within an hour or whatever. Um, And they're like, that is not the case. Um, Normally, they're like, I mean, Brigham Young is, it's a Mormon school, and they kind of have a thing, you know, they have this very extensive, like, interview, particularly, like, the, the religious stuff, and looking through all your uh credentials and everything like that and there's like there's just no way that they would have just let him walk in and get a job it's like a pretty um it's a process like to get professors in there and it's pretty extensive also the funniest thing that one of the things they found out later is that i guess he had um (laughs) frank like to show that he actually was a professor at byu he had a picture of himself 
supposedly, you know, uh, teaching there. And in the picture, you can see his desk, like, uh, that was apparently at the front of the classroom. And the desk has a can of Mr. Pibb on it. But this photo was supposedly taken in the 60s, and Mr. Pibb was not around until 1972. Like, it wasn't invented until 1972. So he took that photo later and then, you know, said, yeah, I taught at BYU, like, back in the day, even though... Yeah, Mr. Pibb didn't exist back then when that picture was supposedly taken. So, uh, so yeah, there's that. And so these articles, like, saying all of this stuff that I just told you, like, all, all of the bullshit that he talked about, there were two articles that came out in 1978 before his autobiography even came out because he had been on TV, like, saying all these stories before his book came out, right? So it's like everybody's pretty familiar with his, with his narrative, so the thing about it, so these two stories are published in 1978. It was like, look, everything he's saying is like pretty much a lie. Like this whole story, like it's a great story. I'm not saying that, but it's just like everything he's saying is a lie. And it didn't really get any traction. Like nobody, like, like I said, you know, a couple years later, he published his autobiography. There was like a whole big thing. Then Steven Spielberg actually bought the rights to his story not too long after it was published, it just took that long, like to get the movie made. You know, what I, I gotta mean? see this movie. It's good. It's good. Yeah, and it, it's it, it's a fucking it, it's it's a it's fun. It's a fun movie. Yeah, and it's fucking uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, not River Phoenix. Yeah, Ru- no, no. What's the guy's name? What's the actor's name? That did Leonardo it? DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. Yeah. His brother was River Phoenix, wasn't he? Weren't no they brothers. No. For some reason, I thought they were brothers. No, they're not brothers. Okay, I don't know what he is, but okay. Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, Joaquin Phoenix is his brother. Thinking. Yeah, yeah, he was who's a great actor. Yeah, I like Joaquin. Yeah, Phoenix. I like Joaquin Phoenix. He's fucking great. Fucking, I, I, when he first appeared, I was thinking this guy's not gonna, this guy ain't shit. No, over the years, fucking Joaquin Phoenix is fucking a, a fantastic actor. Fucking Gladiator, The Joker, just that one where he played that fucking cowboy. Those two brothers that we saw in the fifth theater, remember that? That's fucking really good. Yeah. But um, yeah, I gotta see. I gotta see this movie. Yeah, it's good. I gotta see this movie. You can rent it. It's on. Um, I think it's Amazon Prime for like two dollars and seventy nine cents or something. Xanadu's been, I, sen- been sending me uh, fucking films of fucking um, uh, DiCaprio, and I'm starting to get like a better better appreciation for it. We still got to do Blood Diamonds. I, you know, I, I'm of the age where I saw him as a child actor. Yeah. You know, I'm older than him. Well, we're actually the same age, probably. But um, I liked Romeo and Juliet. Fucking great movie he was in. Fucking, man, Claire Danes and everything. She was so cute back in those days. And it's a fucking great adaptation. But that's kind of like the only movie that I really appreciated. But then they're sending me more. Of, yeah. And, and he's fucking... DiCaprio's good, man. He's really good. He's good in gangster roles, fucking just everything. But as an, as a cop or an investigator, I like to see him in this role. So I'm g- gaining a new appreciation for DiCaprio. Late, I'm late to the DiCaprio game. Yeah, but, you uh, would probably really like this movie. Like I said, this yeah. it's you know it's fairly old. It came out in yeah. 2002. I got Blood uh, Diamond sitting over there. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, that'll probably be our next review. Yeah, yeah. We're we'll do, do Blood next. Diamond, and then I got I bought you a couple movies for Valentine's yeah. Day. I bought him Dark City and The Cell. So yeah. we're gonna do those in the Been next couple to see weeks. Blood too. Diamond. That's what got me on the DiCaprio game through Xanadu. I love Blood Diamond. It's really good. I was building a fucking Blood Diamond carving, which is a X one seven seven or a Car fifteen version of, of fucking M sixteen. I was I, I have one, but I've never seen the movie. I've just seen a photograph of the rig that he was running. I didn't camouflage it. I'm not going to spray paint it green. I'm just going to keep it black. But I got that. I got the fucking streamlight fucking bar- uh, light and everything. Fucking uh, A1 upper with A1 sights on it. I got the fucking scope. I got the scope mount. I just got to get the damn optics for it. Uh, which I'm going to get a reproductive optic for Primary Arms makes a fucking optic that looks a lot like the one out of that movie that can go on there. The original optic he was using is one of the aim points. It's too fucking expensive. You can't find it now. It's a collector's item. So I'm going to get the uh, the aim point version of it. But I own that rifle. So I want to see the movie, though. 
I just saw the damn scene with him running around and looking at well, his Well, we'll watch it this weekend because yeah, we'll like a, we can review it on Monday. We'll see, yeah. Like I said, we can do Blood Diamond and then we can do Dark City and then we can do yeah. Cell. Cause, so we have three movies like, coming out. Yeah, he was running a customized X, XM177 or Car 15. Yeah. I want to see it. Yeah, James says any institution of BYU quality, like say Central Florida, no way you get a job without extensive reference and papers published. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, and particularly BYU, which like I said is a Mormon institution, they're going to go through the rigorous religious kind of shit too. So you just going in there and being like, hey, I just wanted to, you know, I was a pilot, now I want to be a teacher. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. I don't think that's going to work. What? Oh, another thing that we got to watch is we got the cell. Jennifer Lopez, The Cell. I just said that. I said oh, I've Dark okay. City and The Cell. Okay. I said okay, I bought yeah. them for you for yeah, Valentine's Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just said that. I didn't hear you say The Cell. Yep. Okay. Um, Allison said that we're talking about Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. That Leo and Claire hated each other. That's funny. It's I, you can't tell. Which, can't like tell. I said, good actors. Yeah. Claire Danes is so fucking cute. I loved her in fucking uh, um, Broken Down Palaces, where where she played. It was true. It was based on a true story about two girls that get locked up and had to go to prison. In some prison in Thailand for drug smuggling, I think it was Thailand. It was another great movie. But she, yeah, she was a cutie that just kind of came and went from the '90s. You don't see her much anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, she could be in stuff nowadays. She's probably in stuff, but you just doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. She just had a certain look that was very '90s, you know, for yeah. me. Yeah. So, um, okay, so let's see more fun facts that were probably not true. So remember how I said that Frank was in Louisiana? Yeah. And he took the bar exam, and he said over a 13-week period, he took it three times, but he passed it the third time? Mm -hmm. Um, Impossible. They said they only offer the bar exam once every six months. Uh, So if he had taken it three times, that would have been 18 months. 18 months. You know, not 13 weeks. (laughs) So there's that. Um, also another claim, and he made this in his book and they actually used this in the marketing for the movie when it came out was that Frank Abagnale was on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list. Also bullshit. He was never on that. Um, even though he kept saying that, and like I said, they even used it in the marketing for the movie, but it is not true. He was never on any most wanted list ever. Um, cause like I said, in real life, his yeah. crimes were minor He's kind of reminding me of Frank Dukes. And Frank you know Dukes. what's funny oh, is that when I was watching a documentary about him. Yeah. And like kind of a funny documentary. It was like two yeah. guys like kind of riffing yeah. on it. And someone in the comments made that same comparison and said you should do. He's like, oh, yeah. they, sh- they should do a boxing match between Frank Dukes and yeah, like Frank yeah. Abagnale. If y'all don't know who Frank Dukes is, he was the we one. We did a show about he him. He was too. a lion motherfucker who was a martial arts instructor. And I think totally self-styled martial arts instructor. I, I'm probably no betrayed him who claimed to have been in what was called the Kumite that they based a whole fucking movie on his lies called Bloodsport. Bloodsport. With yeah. Jean-Claude Which Van Damme. Which is a great movie. It's a fun movie. It is a fun movie. Jean-Claude Van Damme. It's like a fucking, it's like watching a fucking video game. An 80s video game. <laughs> And at the end of that bitch, we were watching it, man. Me and my buddy Mike watched it like two or three times. We watched it a lot back when we believed in Kung Fu. And at the end, it actually had statistics. You, you were like, wait a minute, hold on. This is a true story? This is a true story? How... <laughs> it was not a true story. But no. even the director knew that Frank Ducks was fucking lying. But, but they didn't care because they're they like, care. It makes it's a, better, a movie. It's a better movie if they, at the end, make you think this shit's real. Because real life is usually kind of boring. Yeah. <laughs> you got to sex it up some. Blood sport. Yeah. And what was so funny about blood sport, all they were talking about is MMA. Yeah, well. MMA. Because back in the 80s, if you had described MMA to us, we would think like, oh, that's, that's not possible. That's illegal. They would never allow that. But yeah, they will. <laughs> Ultimate wrestling, ultimate fighting. That's what came, and then it became MMA. But there's a certain type of personality, and like I said, I'm kind of glad you brought up Frank Dukes, because Frank Abagnale seems like the same kind of person. Um, Some people just can't help themselves. It just seems like they have these fantastical... 
I mean, even Frank Abagnale, I, I don't remember if it was one of his friends or one of his relatives, basically called, straight up called him a pathological liar. Mm. Like, he just makes stuff up. Like, he can't help it. Yeah. Because um, he does kind of seem like that. And he's very self-aggrandizing. Like I said, um, he's al- always talking about, oh, you know, I went into the, when I was working at the hospital and I went into the medical library and I have a photographic memory so I could remember all of this stuff. And, you know, and he always just has stuff about you know oh people call me a genius but like i'm like okay you know what yeah, i mean it's people, just it's, it's people that, call me a genius it's that kind of thing i could do that all day he long. even he even like gave talks i think yeah. he gave one talk at like a mensa thing or something yeah. like that before they found out like you know how full of shit he was um oh and he also said that he had um made a whole like millions and millions of dollars from a bunch of patents like he had all these patents for things like him and his company had it and that is also bullshit. He doesn't have any patents for shit. Uh, so there's that. And um, again, he still claims this, because I've seen like some recent talks that he gave. He still claims that he works for the FBI. He said he worked for them. He said he works for them for free, yeah. um, like pro bono. But um, you talk to the FBI and they're just like, no. They're like... They're like, we think maybe he gave a couple of speeches at like the academy or something, but it's like he doesn't work here. Yeah. You know what I mean? But he'll but he acts like they're like when he talks about the FBI, he's like, We did this and we did that. I'm now celebrating thirty eight years with working with the FBI and they're just like, Yeah, we don't he Yeah, how much could they learn from one offender? He doesn't work here. They don't need that bitch. And like I said, and he wasn't yeah. really that good at it because he kept yeah. getting caught. His whole narrative was oh i did this stuff when i was a teenager and i only got caught one time in france but like i said those reporters found out that was bullshit he got caught all the time he was arrested in several u.s states as well as france and sweden that's just like frank dook saying that he fucking worked for cia there's a certain type of personality that bitch they don't need that bitch (laughs) there's a certain type of personality that like i said it's almost like they can't help themselves yeah i don't know if it's just because they feel super inadequate so they're just like well i have to make up shit to make myself sound super awesome like i'm fucking james bond or something um and i kind of feel like it was a lot easier to get away with back then obviously even though he obviously didn't get away with it as much as maybe frank dukes did but frank dukes wasn't really doing anything illegal yeah james neps is going oh the fucking jean glove on damn the blood sport movie Yeah. yeah that's all bullshit that is based on a real guy's story, but he, he's lying. His name is Frank Dux. And there's a lot of fucking... He was in karate magazines and all the fucking martial arts magazines of the 80s. And he just lied his way into fame. You know, saying that he actually went to this kumite where they he killed some dude in combat and he fought all these fights back to back. He... <laughs> Somebody did the math, and they were like, wait a minute, hold on. He'd, he'd have to fight, like, 30 dudes a day to get that shit done. That's a lot of fighting. Fuck it, no, no. He was lying. He was well, lying. obviously. We had somebody in the comments section when we, we when I was, we had a whole show. Go back and look at our show. It was called um, Bullshito. Bullshito. Bullshito, like bullshit. Bullshito. <laughs> we did it, and it's all the bullshit about martial arts. That was a fun show, It was actually. a fun show. <laughs> somebody, when we were doing that, live stream said that they knew Frank Ducks and they met Frank Ducks because they were uh, they were in martial arts themselves and they said that the dude told all kinds of lies and he was obviously a pathological liar. You know? See, I think there comes a point, obviously, a pathological you know, back liar. then, you know, and you see it with Frank Abagnale, you see it with yeah. Frank Dukes. Back then it was easier to get away with because you didn't have the internet. It's like you couldn't you really check. check. Yeah. I mean, you could, but you'd have to be real, you know, you'd have to be a cop. Or, you have to be a private investigator. Or, or a private investigator or something yeah. like that with like access to that kind of, you couldn't just like Google the shit, you know what I mean? And be like, mm, no. No, Frank Dukes lied his way. Yeah. And, and evidently the director that fucking directed Bloodsport and everything, the movie Bloodsport, by all accounts, he knew that Frank Dukes was a bullshitter. He's like, no way could this shit have actually happened. Well, like happened. I said, he was just wanted to make a cool movie. Yeah, he didn't like, give a, a cool shit. Movie, he didn't We're give a shit whether it was true or not. Yeah. That's, he had a different set of priorities. Yeah, yeah, see? yeah, yeah, yeah. See, he's just being inspired by these guys, this guy's tall tales. Now, related story, Jeremiah Johnson is probably a bunch of bullshit, too, which is another... Most stuff is bullshit, Which sadly. is a favorite, an old West legend. Nothing's as fun I as like you think it is. Jeremiah Johnson, he's probably... <laughs> Probably that didn't happen. There was a Jeremiah Johnson, but I do not believe that he 
cut the leg off of an Indian and beat another Indian to death with it and then walked home 130 miles gnawing on that far- frozen leg in the winter to get back home. Not impossible, but it does sound very far-fetched. Doesn't, sound, doesn't sound right, do it? Sounds a little far-fetched. Sounds far-fetched. He was also known as Liver Eating Johnson. He was a cannibal. You know, an old west cannibal, but I think he also and he was an army scout, and I think he made up a lot of stories about what he did, killing the crow Indian. He was in a fucking one man war against the crow, but then the crow ended up adopting him because he was like their the children grew up. They considered him to be the boogeyman, but they liked him, so he became a crow in the end. Quite funny when you think about it. See, like I said, I do kind of feel like there's a particular type of personality. Maybe it's pathological lying. Maybe they can't help themselves. Um, Certain types of people are more fantasy prone than others. Yeah. That it's just, they can't just have a regular ass job or like a regular, they always have to be like, I'm a special agent. Like I, you know, I'm James Bond was based on me. Right. It's like, they always have to, they always have to have like, be the fucking outlandish, like top best of everything. It's like, I'm the best at everything. And this, it's just like, I don't really get that mindset. Yeah. But maybe they can't help it. It seems like a mental illness of some kind. Yeah, but it, Jeremiah Johnson, I do believe he was an army scout. There's records to support that. He was a mountain man. He did have a flathead wife who was another one of the Indians. He was at war with the Crow, but I think that fucking a lot of this tales that he made up about well, what now, he did against Well, now, I mean, just regular people yeah. will embellish yeah. stories over the years. Yeah. Whether you're aware of it or, you know, you've told this story a bunch of times and you just want to, like like I said, just sex it up a little bit. So you're just going to add some details in there. Yeah. You might be adding some stuff because memory isn't that good. So you're maybe you do remember it like that. I don't know. Yeah. But, like, as time goes on, you're just, like, adding, like, more exciting details to it. Yeah. I get that. But now, but now I got it wrong, though, remember. It wasn't a Crow Indian that he cut the leg off of him that escaped. It was some other Indians that were going to sell him to the Crow. I don't remember which one it was, though. Remember, the crow wanted him. He yeah. got captured by his mother and he was able to go fucking sell to the crow. According to his story. Yeah. According to his story. But I just, I'm fascinated by that yeah. kind of personality, I guess. Just because I'm not like that yeah. at all. Yeah. So it's just kind of, it's, you know, I'm, if anything, I'll um, downplay shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm like the opposite. Yeah. So I'm kind of fascinated by people that just blatantly. Yeah. Make, make shit up, up. Yeah. like when, when you could easily cooler. when you could easily check yeah. like it is but especially nowadays you could easily check would you just like yeah i work for the fbi and i do this yeah. that and the other thing like i could find out in five minutes if you were lying chances on. are though a lot of the fucking um a lot of the characters from uh american mythology were basically doing that i think fucking you know davy crockett and daniel boone and all those guys probably fucking told tall tales I well, know. and then other people start mythologizing yeah. them too, and then like kind of putting it into a coherent yeah. narrative that's more like a hero's journey type story. Yeah. So you know, any inconvenient details get left out, you know, and everything gets kind of like, you know, codified into, you know, a, a more yeah. s- structured story. Even people of the time said that Jim Bowie, the guy who was the inventor of the Bowie knife, was full of shit. <laughs> He just told a lot. He was a big dude, but, you know, he did not kill a grizzly bear with a Bowie knife. But he, he claimed to have. But it's just another one of the things. A lot of, a lot of the legendary guys are full of shit. <laughs> well, like I said, and, and the Over thing... time, it kind of fucking sounds... The thing about plausible. it, though, is that I think most people that know them, like, know that they're full of shit. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. hey, we're all in the bar, like, having yeah. some sarsaparilla or whatever. Yeah. And he's just like, yeah, man, I was, like, walking down this, like, yeah. I fucking wrestled an alligator, and it's just yeah. like, you know what I mean? And it's just, you know, and everybody's just like, yeah, cool, Carl, whatever. Yeah. Some of them, some of them weren't, though. Wild Bill Hickok really was a good shot. I mean, he, he used to do it live in front of fucking audiences in a Wild West show later on. And he was involved in some gunfights, but you had to be careful when you look yeah, at the, some of these legendary Old West figures. Some, about half of them are full of shit. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. I, I don't I don't believe most of the kind of... Yeah. Because after, and especially as more time goes by, yeah. other people add details. Yeah. And just to make it a better story, like yeah. I said. Because real life is kind of boring. Yeah. Usually. So it's like, you need something to kind of add some In reality, there was nothing to Billy the Kid, and there wasn't much to Jesse James. 
Not really. Yeah, if you were there, it wouldn't have been, yeah. like, super impressive. No. It's just, like, later on, like, all of these right. legendary kind of, like, right. details get added on. But, uh, but like I said, I kind of feel like... I think that's why I'm kind of fascinated by con men like this. Because the crazy thing about Frank Abagnale is that he's, like... It's, like, a metacon. Not, like, megacon. Not as cool yeah. as that. But it's a metacon because he's conning people into thinking that he was the world's greatest con artist, which in a way maybe does make him the world's greatest con artist, right? Yeah. Because everybody believed it. Steven Spielberg made a movie about it, yeah. but all of the stuff that was in his book, almost all the stuff was bullshit or yeah. at least exaggeration. Yeah. Somebody so asked, he did. Asked, he pulled off a really big con, just somebody, not the one that you think that he somebody did. Somebody asked me, you know, how, do, how is it that I know that Jim Bowie didn't kill a, a grizzly bear with a knife? Um, yeah, it was a... Okay, the, the original Bowie knife wasn't as big as a modern one. It was not the size of a machete. It was, you know, about the size of a modern bayonet. And it was made out of a saw blade, and he was selling them. He'd go into bars, and he'd tell these stories, and he'd sell them. Okay, he sold Bowie knives. That's what he did. He claimed to have been fucking attacked by and so badly mauled that he had to claw, crawl his way back and recover from... But uh, according to people that knew him, that, that, he, that was a story that he basically made up to help him sell knives. So, no. And in those days, if you got badly mauled by a grizzly bear, you were going to die. You know? Yeah, I don't really think you'd they survive didn't, that. They didn't have antibiotics back then. They were like, well, you're, you're fucked. Gonna die. The chances <laughs> of you actually surviving that would be fucking very low back in the 1800s. But, uh, no, Bowie was just, he told a lot of tall tales. A lot of it under the influence of alcohol. He spent most of his time in a, in a, in a bar. He yeah, was a physically big guy. That's what the dudes back then would do. They, they would did. stand around, they would get drunk, and then stories. they would try to one-up each other's story. Yeah, and, and, and with Bowie, he was selling knives. Yeah. So. It would behoove him to be like. You're right, yeah. I'm going to tell you what I did. You, know, you need one, too. You could kill a grizzly bear with this motherfucker. Yeah, you could kill a grizzly bear with this motherfucker. Sure. And then uh, he sold some, but Bowie-type knives appeared everywhere in the Old West. Uh, they were made independently. Whether Jim Bowie had nothing to do it, he didn't really invent it. It was actually based upon a Spanish knife that was around. Because we, like I told you, Spanish influence in the South and in the Old West was strong because the Spanish and the French were here also. So they had a Spanish knife that was kind of like based upon a Roman gladius, kind of. And they usually cut them out of a used up wooden, uh, wood, uh, used up saw blade that was came out of sawmills after it had cut up a bunch of fucking logs and it get kind of dull. They turn them into knives because that was a good steal for. It. But uh, Jim Bowie didn't even really invent the Bowie knife. He just kind of his legend kind of helped popularize it. Other guys had knives that were very similar. I think that kind of happens a lot, unfortunately. Yeah. You kind of see that a lot. Like, the person that invented the thing is not usually the person that gets no, famous because of the thing. Yeah, he just kind of... It's usually, like, the marketing person yeah, or the person that yeah. bought it from the person yeah. that invented it big and ass, knew how to market it, you know. Big-ass knives based on that Spanish fighting knife or a survival knife were in vogue at that time, and Jim Bowie kind of had his own spin on Allison said, David Mamet made a movie about con artists in 1986 called House of Games. It's fabulous. Yeah, I remember seeing that like a while back, and I remember that being really good. That might be another movie that we need to revisit, because I remember liking that a lot. But I haven't seen it probably since the 90s, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, all right, so do we have anything else that we need to cover? Mm, I, I think know. not. I kind of okay. got to the end of my note. Let me see if right. there's anything else that i wanted to mention you know yeah i did mention that like people were calling abagnale on his bullshit like in the 70s and actually even in um he went to give a talk at a university back in 1981 and even then like a couple people like students in the audience were like um hey your your shit's bullshit <laughs> you know what i mean so even back then like people were calling him out on it but i guess there wasn't enough of a critical mass of people calling him out on it too really uh you know penetrate into the mainstream because as far as i know and i didn't really know that he that that book was completely bullshit until 
I started researching this show. Like I said, I didn't really have to think about it all that much, but I just remembered reading the book and thinking, wow, that's a crazy story. And then seeing the movie, which is great. But, you know, some of it, like I said, seemed a little implausible, but I was just kind of like, oh, okay, whatever. I didn't really think about it that much. But then, like, when I was going back to look at it, I was just like, oh, yeah, a lot of that stuff probably was really implausible. And, yeah, it turned out that it was. So a lot of that didn't happen or it was, like, super exaggerated. So I hate to, like, piss in everyone's cornflakes, but <laughs> that's just kind of how it goes sometimes. Uh, it's not as fun as it seemed but it is a good movie though you should you would probably love it i feel like you would love it okay. it's a fun movie you know what i mean it's fun it's action-packed like i said they have it it's on amazon prime but i think it's two dollars and or it's 2.99 or something like that because i looked earlier i was gonna watch it again and then i was like eh, i don't think i'll have time because we had a bunch of other shit we had to do with the car and i had yeah. a bunch of design jobs i had to do today i did i made three fucking posters today Oh, did you? Good. Yeah. The car is uh, reaching completion, I think. I'm just going to have that drive shaft rebuilt. It's only 125 bucks for that. You gonna hang that? You gonna hang that disco ball in there? No, I'm not gonna. Pimp it. <laughs> the other shit I got ordered, and it's just gonna be fucking elbow grease. I, you know what I mean? I just somebody, I gotta, I gotta uh, pull that headliner and recover that headliner and put it back in there. It's gonna look fucking like a brand new car. Car smelling good too. It smelled like shit when we first got it. Dude, it's smoking like a demon. I sprayed the fucking roof where the dome light was, and all the damn tar from the guy's cigarettes ran down into driplets. And fucking solidified there when it dri when it dried. I mean, Jim were driving, and I was looking at that shit, and I could see that. I reached up there and touched some of that tar, and went to go smell it. And actually, got some of my fucking nose. Like, Man, that's fucking tar. Because I used to smoke. I'm an ex smoker, so I, I know what it. Yeah, like, you smoked for years and years. Yeah, ex smokers are more revolted by smoking than people who have never smoked. For some reason, it's just I've, something I've noticed. I'm fucking. I hate smoking now. Just which is fun. I never which I thought. I never would have thought. I never that. thought that would. I would have never thought that. Because I remembered very distinctly you telling me. Oh, I, I loved it. I like smoking. I'm not. I don't want to. I would never quit smoking. No, yeah, I'm back. You said I that. I hate it. Several times. Once you kick the habit, you just like fucking. You hate it. Shit It's disgusting. Yeah. Well, you realize, you realize like, how how gross it is. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't seem gross when you're doing it, but yeah. you can see how gross it is like to other people. Yeah. So I've been going behind dashboards and fucking shit, and then you can see that fucking yellow fucking tar stains. Where that dude was in there fucking smoking. He was either smoking cigarettes, I guess. I don't think it's I don't think it's pipe or cigar. Well, it was his wife's car. It was his so, wife, so, so she was in there smoking them damn cigarettes. Yeah. I'm gonna go in there and find that damn atmospheric filter and fucking change those atmospheric filters in there to filter the air conditioning and recycle the air in there. I'm gonna get those changed. I bet you they're fucking. As yellow as a fucking cigarette filter. Yeah. I just got to look it up. I don't know where they are. They, we had them in the Taurus. So we, they have to be in that... They have to be in that fucking Crown Vic somewhere. It's well, not a Crown Vic. Someone it's a, it's on Marquee. YouTube will tell us. Yeah. Like I said. I love that Grand, I love that Grand Marquis. That's nice. It's, an, a, Crown it's Vic. a nice car. I wish you, I'm almost wishing I should have got a Lincoln Town car. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a stress maybe version of that. Maybe eventually we'll get one. <laughs> Give me old fucking Lincoln. Even more pimped out. It is a nice car. It's very comfortable. Very comfortable. And like I said, when you know, now that we've done some work on it, now that he's done some work on it, yeah. when I was driving it back, because you know, obviously we had to we had to trade the cars. trade the we had to drive two cars down there. Yeah. So it's like so I was driving it back from the mechanic, and I was just like calling. Because I'm a lead foot, okay? I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to speed. I'm used to, like, driving my Taurus, so I'm kind of used to what that's like. Um, this car, the engine is a lot more powerful. It's a bunch So it was, like, scaring me because it's like I'm putting my foot down. I'm like, oh, shit. I'm like, I'm yeah. going, like, fucking yeah. 70 miles an hour, and I'm, like, at a 45, and I'm like, yeah. uh-oh. So, yeah, I had to, like, slow down. Yeah, Ford 4.6 liter V8. Same engine that was in the Mustang GT for those years. Not the same exhaust, not the same intake, but similar performance and people don't realize that the crowd victoria was only a few a few hundred pounds heavier you know what i mean it didn't really matter some people some people are young guys are calling this shit the four-door mustang it's like a mustang but four-door yeah. it looks like a damn cop car you know cop car or a taxi or a fucking mine's a luxury version 
Or is this like I'm gonna a, fucking pimp that shit out, man. I'm gonna put the fucking computer navigation and good shit. I'm not gonna put the starlight fucking headline. You did ask about that. Yeah, you, know? they, you were just kind of like, you you're put, like, is that too much? I'm like, yeah. No, yeah, you can put fucking lighting effects in the ceiling. That's too much. So it's like stars going up. That's why I tease you about the disco ball. <laughs> yeah. Because I almost kind of felt like you're like, I kind of want to do that shit. I'm like, please, no. I'm, more, I'm thinking about, I, wanna, I wouldn't mind changing some atmospheric mood lights. Oh dear. Like in the in, in the footwells. Yeah. So you have like some lighting and shit around there. <laughs> Because the Cadillacs have it. Some mood lighting. Some mood light in there. Make that shit more pent out. Make it all romantic in there. We can in jump in the back and fuck. Make a whole <laughs> video. Talk about that. That's why I figured you wanted mood lighting. Yeah. You could just put some of those like RGB lights like we yeah. have in the bedroom. The uh, We bought the new bed we bought also has LED lights. LED lights, yeah. Colored LED lights in the headboard. In the headboard. And yeah. in the nightstands. You can change as many color you want patterns. Yeah, and you shit. can make them all colors. and Yeah. It's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Make some porn. Yeah, we haven't done it in the... Yeah. But it's nice having the new bed that's not broken. <laughs> yeah, we we haven't broken this one yet. Not, we're not going to break that one. I hope not. Nah. I mean, that would be bad if we broke it already. Yeah. We, we haven't had it that long. Yeah. Well, we had it like a week, we're not right? Break it. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. And like I said, it's got lights in it. All right, so I guess I kind of covered everything that I wanted to cover about this, and we've been on for two hours and... 40 minutes so yeah. i figure we kind of hold on one second what? side uh -oh. quest hero saying what what's on streaming she said she saw something streaming i just paramount. checked all the streaming it's only available on paramount plus what's otherwise you got to pay maybe um she might be talking about um catch me if you can oh okay but like i said right. yeah you can rent it i saw i think it's on prime but i you can rent it but i think it's only 2.99 yeah i want to introduce side quest hero to the to the show that's my uh that's my lesbian army girlfriend she's a she's 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 a veteran like a yeah she's been here she's lots of times in the, yeah, in the just chat just let y'all know that yeah that's, that's my that's my lesbian girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> we she she's a cool chick we will we, we we uh we, we talk on instagram quite a bit yeah um so yeah that's about. that was the movie she was talking about yeah i because i looked earlier i was yeah. gonna rewatch it and then I was like, eh, I probably don't have time. But yeah, I mean, I don't mind paying yeah. to rent it, to be honest. Yeah, Cyclist. I think they have, well, huh? Cyclist is, yeah, it's what it oh. is. She's laughing. Um, yeah. yeah, I think you could rent it for two ninety nine, and yeah. I think you could buy it for four ninety nine okay. on Prime. I want to see a movie. I now. mean, I think that you would probably really like it. I remember it, right? I remember it being really entertaining. I didn't know Spielberg made this movie. Yeah, okay. 2002. I like Spielberg. So Spielberg. DiCaprio is still pretty young. Yeah. He's, I like them both. We'll yeah. see what it's like. You probably, I think you'll be into it. It's okay. it's fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nobody Kinda gets like no, a pain and gain. Yeah, like it's yeah, yeah. yeah, like nobody gets killed. It's just kinda, right, yeah, yeah, it's crime, but it's not like yeah. you know horrible, tragic yeah. crime. Really. One of the best Florida movies is Pain and Gain. Mark Wahlberg. Yeah. And it's a, it's a true story, about a fucking dude that's in a, works in a gym and's committing all kinds of crimes, dressed up as a ninja, and all his friends. The Rock's in it and everything. It's a great movie. It's funny as fuck. It is hilarious. based on a true story. Yeah, uh, yeah. Next that, is, that actually is based on a true yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, and they didn't really. I mean, they embellished it, but yeah. not that much. Pain and gain. Because I looked up the real story, and I'm just like, mm. they took some artistic license, but not a lot. The same director that made all the fucking Transformers. Not a lot. Movies. What's his name? Fucking made the Transformers movies. Oh uh, shit, I can't remember What's that his, guy's his name. name. I don't know. Michael Bay. Oh yeah, right. Michael Bay movie. The explosion guy. Yeah, explosion dude. That's how I was. Yeah. Michael Explosion Bay. Yeah, That's yeah, how yeah, I always yeah. think of him. Danny says it's a fucking great show tonight, Jenny. Thank you very much. Like I said, this was a topic I'd been wanting to do for a long time, so yeah. I so I really took a deep dive on it. So hopefully yeah. you guys enjoyed this show this evening. Yeah. So uh so yeah, so we will be back as always on Friday night for the sidetrack show, which is my favorite show of the week, because we just drink and talk about a bunch of bullshit. And uh so that should be fun. Are we going out on Friday? So we might have yeah, to Yeah, we could probably go out. I mean, I don't know. We could hey, go out Friday ready, or, or Saturday. Everything's ready. Car will be at one hundred percent, pretty much. Or yeah. we can go on both. We can go both. Oh yeah, we got the tags for the we car got tags. too. We can go both. So we can it's go we got insurance, seven. we got tags, we got yeah. everything. So it's completely legal. Now. Yeah, I got we got so much money. It's not even fucking funny. Well, look at my face. It's not funny. <laughs> look at my face. It's not funny. Yeah, you have substantially more money than I have. 
I got more coming. Yeah, you do. We need we need some money though, people. Go ahead. Says the super. Yeah, I was gonna say banks. don't don't let people think we. Yeah, like, yeah, won I'm the not lottery. that rich. Just uh, you know, we didn't win dad no lottery died, got my inheritance. Yeah, uh, we'll burn through that after a while, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll it's see. not it's not a infinite. Yeah, it's not infinite. Money. It's not an infinite. It's and not like infinite. I said, we did have to spend some money on the car like, yeah, to get yeah, it up yeah. to right. up to speed. And like I said, we did buy a new bed and curtains yeah. and all because that we're shit was all. Furnish some shit up in here too. Yeah, we do. We do need some more furniture because all our furniture is like so. Yeah. Crappy and, looking. Um, what is it? Next month, uh, um, fucking um, Anastasia is going to be guest hosting with That's us. That's right. Who is a goth chick who's a Mensa. She's a fucking nuclear physicist. She knows and DJ Mania. She, yeah, they're up in New York right now together. They and hang out all here. the time up there. She's from here. She, yeah. And that's how, isn't that how she met him or they met each other? Because she was like, oh, I know them in real life. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Because she yeah. used to live down here, yeah. and we used to see her at the clubs She's all the time. She's coming out here to visit her parents. She's going to st- spend a couple of days with us. She wants to go to the clubs with go us. Go to the clubs. She wants to go Friday and Saturday. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it'll be, I think it'll be the end of March. We yeah. might get her to come on the on a live yeah, stream, yeah. too. Yeah, Y'all will like her. If she, like yeah, her. she's cool. It's the 22nd of next month, I think. I haven't seen her in a long time, because yeah. she's moved away a long tall. time. Yeah. But, tall. Tall, um, cute chick, uh, smart, crazy. Y'all are like her. And we'll, we'll just keep her talking. Yeah. <laughs> Should be funny. Allison said, this was fun. Good night, yeah. all. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we're going to go to go watch something or go to sleep or something. I might get one more drink, but yeah. we'll see how it goes. I don't really have a whole fuck ton of stuff to do tomorrow, I don't think. Yeah. But yeah. So thank you, everybody, for dropping by this evening. And we will see you guys again on Friday night. Good 